I've had a lot of time to walk outside. It's one of my favorite things to do. Certainly, you know, probably from my, my 30s on, but not, not as consistently as I have the last 10 years. I've always liked being outside ever since I was young, and like a lot of people, and I enjoyed it. I was watching alone Australia, people with some survival background trying to live in some random place by killing, hunting, and foraging, and staying out of the rain, and it's like, wow, you know? And this one guy was really angry, you know? And I'm like that every day sometimes for the first three hours. And you can't accomplish anything like surviving when you're angry, you know? Like, he's just, everywhere he goes, he just hates every step he takes. Then eventually he falls and hurts his knee. And it's like nothing worse than a bad ab attitude to take out, right? But I can't fault the guy. I mean, people are human and, you know, he's upset. So there's no, no lie there, but there's no, no wrong there, no sin in that. You know? But it is um, a real disadvantage, you know? So it became his Achilles knee. You are, you're more likely to fuck up when you get angry and tired and hasn't eaten for three days. So it's like, that sucks. And that's the thing, right? Maintaining a good positive attitude is, you know, I'm not a survivalist, so if I was out there, I'm watching it, you know, living vicariously, right, through these courageous people's trials. And um, if I was out there, I'd be like, yeah. They're like, why are you out here? It's like, because I have no skills whatsoever. And I want to prove to the world that just pure intuition, I will be able to survive. And I, what are you doing now? I'm laying in the grass, waiting for food to fall in my lap. You know, it's like, oh, look, the rain. That's water. You know, one guy collects the rainwater. No one else does. It's like free water. They're all boiling their water. He just collects the rainwater and drinks it out of his boot. You know, it's like, huh, free water. It's like, hmm. you know, that's pretty cool. They're not near a city, so there's no worry about smog and particulates, you know. It's like, and he lives. So they all just hate the rain. He drinks the rain. So there's one simple example right there. The first woman to catch, first person to catch any fish or any food is a woman. She catches an eel. So there's two women that are doing pretty good that I've seen. And uh, one or two men doing really good. So we'll see how it goes. It's going to be between them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 hello, yeah, 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 okay, um, is that a predator rolling by me there, <laughs> sorry, uh, oh, this white society is a predator dominant society, it supports psychopathy, right, at an electronic level, you can, you know, you meet the offbeat ones, you know, and you you spend time with them. Bad things happen. They do bad things. You invite them into your house. Bad things happen. Things disappear. Shit goes down. Your life becomes shit. Every awful fear that every white person has of homelessness and, and indigence creeping into their world basically happens when you invite 9 out of 10 white people into your life. You know, especially if you're not a psychopath. It's a very... You know, psychopaths have a better chance of survival than non-psychopaths. Not necessarily. I think lots of nine psychopaths thrive too, but there's a lot more psychopaths. And if you're not like them, well, you know, that's a hard life if you can't get along with them. Like I said, if you want to teach a non-psychopathic child how to get along with psychopaths, it's like a detective on TV telling his son how to survive in jail. Don't make too much eye contact. Don't make too little, right? Never back down from a fight, you know? It's just like things that you just would never do, really. But the only thing advice you can give is really bad advice. Even though it would make perfect sense when you think of the conditions. It doesn't work. But... Oh, okay, thank you. Um, even though it makes perfect sense, right, to them or to society or to that analogy. Um, uh, nonetheless, uh, it is a very dangerous environment that you can't possibly adjust to. It's a very dangerous environment you can't possibly adjust to. Unless, unless so there are non-psychopaths that 
psychopaths tend to leave alone, but you know, you have to speak their language, right? The psychopath even thinks that someone connected to their prey is stopping them from getting what they want or getting their way. They will try to take them out, you know? Women do that with slander, right? So, you know, I had a woman uh, when I kicked me out of a store because I didn't want to fuck her. And she was making a lot of aggressive eye contact with me. That's happened to me more than once. I have to stop shopping places because women want to fuck me. And they get really weird when you don't make all the eye contact they want. They feel like you're depriving them of the little bit of joy they get that day. Right? Here's looking at you, Rain. I must be very pretty. What with my one missing tooth. You know? I like that my body breaks down, you know? It makes women less likely to want to fuck me. That's why I like to dress up like a homeless person. My mom doesn't realize that it. it's like, it keeps some of the people away. Although white people tend to be a little different with people they think are isolated socially because white people are all psychopaths. So anyone who doesn't look, it's amazing how many rich white psychopaths have stayed off me when I tell them where I live and they just go away. Once they think you have some social or economic means, they leave you alone, which tells you the kind of people they go to. And you don't hear about it, but white people are really awful to people that are in any way socially or economically isolated. They love to be around children. They love to work daycares. I've never met a white female who wasn't a psychopath who owned or worked in a daycare. You ever notice that? You know, there's some really nice people, but they're psychopaths. And although most white people are psychopaths, they're psychopaths, you know? So to someone like me, it's pretty startling, but to most people, it's normal, right? Right, most people white in the white world can't fully develop, you know? You know, and they might be surprised in what ways that they have lost that ability and what it would look like and feel like. Another guy has PTSD, and he says that before he came there, when he got when he got just um, let go by the U.S. government from Iraq, he uh, he got off the plane, and then he started drinking 90 beers a week, 90 beers a week. So he became a drug addict, and he admits to having PTSD. So it's like, oh, he said living off adrenaline for eight months of my life. He said, it was like, hmm. And then you have to think about what he was like before he joined the army. And he looks like an alcoholic. He looks like a sensitive guy. I like him, right? He looks like he should basically live like I do. He shouldn't be on alone Australia. I'm thinking, I need my pot, my coffee. I'm gonna go and... He's liking the quiet moments in nature. That's what he needs. He needs that. That's human, but he's not ready to survive any more than I am, you know? He's got more skills than I do, but he's just not in the right place. Yeah, he needs the healing. He doesn't need to be, you know, surviving in really strenuous conditions. That's for only certain types of people, and I'm not one of them. Yeah. I like my creature comforts. I'm not gonna go and strangle a squirrel or something so I have something to eat. <laughs> this one beautiful black dude, he befriended a squirrel, and then he got so hungry, he decided to kill it. And it's so sad. He started crying. He said, I killed my friend. I killed my friend. It's like, oh God. So basically, if you're in a survival situation, don't befriend the animals you're going to kill. Uh. Got bear energy today. And weasel. Oh god. White woman is singing. Out loud. While listening to her I prefer your pods. <laughs> See a woman can do that, a man can't. Yeah. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. So we've seen uh, one predator today.
there are certain stores, I won't say, systems in the area that, in terms of white people, if not the systems themselves, end up being organized for whatever their outward purpose as a pretext for white psychopaths of different ages and genders to have easy access to their prey. And make no mistake, white people prey on people. That's how they have fun. That's how they bring a little joy into their day. They don't see it as bullying, right? They see it as having fun, right? And since so many of them drink, they're also very volatile. It's like, and you can't do to them what they're doing to you. You can't meet them at their level, right? It's a highly, like white people are, their personalities come from a huge amount of rage and aggression that lives in the whole environment. So, you know, you have to be careful when and what way you get angry with them, you know, because they don't like that. No matter what they do, no one ever tells them no. One lady in the building, the wife of the general manager, got so bad, he had to send her away. Because he was stalking me and getting women in the building to stalk me. Because my mom wouldn't take care of her house and her apartment for free for an entire month. And I think she suspected that I dissuaded my mom from doing this. Right? But actually, it was my mom's own decision. It was for the safety of her and our family member, Buddy, our dog at the time. But they don't give a shit about that. You can see the way these white people would talk to my mom. They suddenly started running into her while she was walking the dog every other day, chatting with her. Not once did they ever mention money. It was like they were doing her a favor. You know what I mean? You see that mindset, right? So of course, when they didn't get what they wanted, they went away. And every time I've seen this couple together, and I've been in their physical presence, I've had an injury or food poisoning, right? Every time, right? These are evil white people. Some people, some white women and their men become absolutely so sick that they literally make other people sick. They're so used to directing their rage at other people because they drink all the time, right? Drinking does not help the mind function properly. And a society that drinks produces violence. So it's like, hey, have a drink for violence. Have a drink for rape. Right? Have a drink for the rape of children. Have a, have a drink for the child suicide. Yeah? Have a drink for the million, million ways you can ruin each other's fucking lives. Difficult as they are already. In the best of circumstances. You doing? I'll come back to alcohol every time. That's what nature teaches me. Oh, okay. As you can see, I'm not quite as angry as I usually am, so we'll see what we have to do today. I think looking forward to the forest. There's one particular forest I'm looking forward to later on. I really enjoy it. And it's not raining today, and I think the sun's going to come out. So I'm um, about 10 minutes away from the forest, so unless somebody molests me before then, it should be pretty good. It's funny, you know, and white people sometimes ask me what I do and I say I write. They never ask me what I write. Ever. You ever seen it interesting? They never ask me, like, what do you write about? You know? Very, you know, I think it must have happened at some point. When white people ask me questions, it doesn't matter what the answers are. And you imagine how they talk to each other. It doesn't matter what you say. They could say, hey, blah, blah, blah. And you'd be like, hey, Venus and vaginas and penises. Oh, very good. I don't think they listen to a word I say. I really don't, you know? Certainly you have to talk to them with a sort of zest for small talk. Hey, how you doing, Joe? Yeah, top of the morning, bottom of the afternoon. Did you see the game last night? Whoa, so that was easy money. What do you think of this and that on TV? I knew young white boys, psychopaths, who had no trouble making small talk. But you have to be a psychopath to enjoy talking to white people, right? Because they never talk about anything real. They always talk around everything, right? 
Like the whole world is just solved by never looking at any of its fundamental problems, which doesn't make any sense because you wouldn't have medicine or engineering or anything without that, but that's how they live. It's like we do space, engineering, mathematics, MRIs, brain surgery, and then talking around every other fucking important medical issue of entire existence. It's amazing, isn't it? It's like, whew, that's quite, uh, quite mind-boggling, you know? If we just even out all our intelligence and capacities, but again, it's like the world at war won't allow it. The English language is a church of death. It's a church of the, of the son of man. It's just the language of death. That car just accelerated behind me. I could tell they were aggressive. Yeah. Yeah, and I heard some aggressive cars near the gas station. Eighth day of the week, is it? It's Monday after the drinking weekend. See, everybody's angry. <sighs> like I said, when I'm not near in the physical proximity of uh, white sexual bitters, I seem to have less headaches. So. Suddenly, it's not the backpack, it's not the shoes, it's just the blood. Oh, just the blood, man. Got the blood bank. Right? Eight and K, which is two or 11. So, death on the ring of death, right in the bank. I see that a lot in English language. Eight, 11. Eight, 11, which makes 10 which is one of the names of God in planet, or death God. It's interesting, a net or ten makes the number three. Yeah. And ten in digits is the number two, so you got three eleven which is the ring of death around the sun, which are called planets, rings of death around the sun. So in the word 10, you have the word planet, the name of God, and why we name the solar system what we do. Isn't that cool? The organs of death around the nuclear Saturnian God. Pops out of his mother's asshole on December 25th. Ready to be crucified as foreplay for taxes and tax farming. People work too hard. It's nice not having so many dedicated stalkers. During COVID, I had, I don't know, dozens of stalkers, dedicated stalkers, local establishments, organizations, private citizens. Oh yeah, and it's like high school, you just go through it. You don't really know what's happening. While it's happening, it's just so overwhelmingly stressful. Right? And uh, you learn a lot. You learn to just keep your head down. I learn to just keep my head down. That wouldn't be enough. Is that enough? Let me see. This way is it for us. You can see sexual predators. You can tell white people that are psychopaths and white people that are sexual predators and will be for the rest of their life. You can even see it when they're children. You can see it from their behavior because it's not about sex. 
It's about the electronics of the brain. Sex is a means to an end for most white people, certainly for psychopaths. You know, if you're thinking about having some lovey-dovey experience, you're wrong. You know, at best, it's a business relationship between white people. It's a job. It's a shared language. That's why Christians stay married so long. They share the language of the ultimate psychopath, God. In fact, there are white family therapists who recommend God for failing relationships to prop them up with the son of death, to remind them what they're really working toward. And so one of the spouses absorbs the other, you know, kind of collapses the pyramid of one side of the corporation. But death is basically bankruptcy at that point. It gets absorbed by the umbrella corporation, usually the female, because a human being is a corporation. You know that, right? You're a, you're a corporation. That's why the courts have jurisdiction over you. Right? It's corporate law. You are a failing corporation. So you're always, it doesn't matter if you're guilty or innocent, you're a failing corporation. You're a debt bearer. It doesn't matter, guilt or innocence is a red herring. You come to the court, a failing corporation, just the way you're born. You come to a relationship with a white person, you're two people who are failed corporations. It's all based on failure and death. The big mistake of life itself. White people have sex and make love out of desperation and indebtedness and lovelessness. It's the farthest thing from love you could possibly get. Right? They make their children out of the libido of death. They become loveless creatures, grasping after the straws that life holds them, the security of their jobs, for one, and their dedication to money, for the other, as a replacement for everything else they were born needing, or even being able to know what it is, at the same time as they can actually, your brain can completely know that you never got what you needed. Right? They would sooner hold every polarity in the universe next to the other and watch a video game without killing babies. Right? It's all catharsis. It's never intelligence. It's just conflict and consummation and death. Tension and release. Tension and release. Tension and release. No wonder nobody's peaceful living in white societies. How do you find peace in that environment? I don't believe anyone who does is anything more than delusional. White society has made the whole planet a giant casino. So places like this, places where no one seems to be able to develop, as they would have by now, some kind of protected land, I don't know. And, but they don't want people walking here. But no one can actually stop you, so they're real. They put these big signs saying no trespassing. And, uh, why would anyone want to be deprived of this place? But most white people don't come here through the winter. Mostly not through the spring and summer. So it's like a dead zone for them. Imagine this being a dead zone. This is a dead zone for everyone who lives in this area. It's a no-go zone for them. Nothing. Nothing can be available on there. Look at how beautiful it is. I came along here one day. One of the last days I walked to Copperick. Beautiful red sky. Sun. And this creepy white woman known to me. Right? Comes up. And there's another creepy woman, two of the biggest ones in the area. I meet them at the same time, so you know this is going to be interesting, right? And she says, oh, do you guys see the red sky? It's like, oh, yeah, it was beautiful, wasn't it? She said, ah, oh, it's just clouds. And moved on to the next subject. That's how white people talk. That's how passive-aggressive they are. It's not worth talking to them. That's how they are, right? And none of them ever notice anything's wrong, right? And then I walked away, and the other fat fuck started throwing balls at me, a dog ball. From behind me, I just kept walking. That's how pathetic they are. And then I decided not to walk there anymore. I put up with it for years. Those same women sexually assaulted me on multiple occasions. And I think one of them drinks in the morning, right? They, you know, in this area, they don't learn boundaries. They don't learn social boundaries. The children don't learn social boundaries, you know? The creeps walking around, excepting myself, don't have social boundaries. You know? And their lives are full of lies. They live around them. You know? I don't like doing business with white people. Dude, there's something always wrong. There's something that freaks you out. There's something missing. There's something missing in their eyes. There's something missing in their work. There's something missing in the atmosphere. There's just something you can't figure out what it is. And you look around, wherever you are, and you start to pay attention. 
and see what level of thought they really put into this environment. Okay? What are you seeing here? When people don't know the value of anything. Yeah. Out here, the customer isn't always right. right. The customers can go fuck themselves if they don't like it because their staff have to be able to sexually abuse and assault and stalk their customers or they wouldn't have anything to do during the day, right? Because they're all a bunch of drug addicts, right? They love their, their monkey Jesus juice, alcohol. Monkey Jesus juice, you get to live the, the, Christian, the Christian life on the other side, right? The Saturnalian side of the mind. Ooh I just lost all my sexual and moral inhibitions. Yeehaw! Life is good again. I love the, the Jesus, Jesus, monkey, Jesus juice. Yeehaw! Ooh-wee! Ooh-wee! Go to the church of alcohol. That's where I like to lobotomize myself, because I'm a stupid fuck. <laughs> Look at this ugly cunt getting more alcohol for his drug-induced fucking malaise. His drug-induced ambivalence to the suffering of others. This will real help real good. And when you look around and you look at the appearances of white people, appearances can really be deceiving, which is really kind of a white figure of speech, isn't it? Appearances can be deceiving, along with keep your friends close, your enemies closer, right? Right? But psychopaths find it easier to put up with other white people, right? They have friends their whole life. You think they're the best of friends, and then... They're gone and they don't give a shit. They were just someone to fill the gap, you know? White people don't have a lot of sentimentality about what things really mean and how deep a relationship really is. Okay? And they probably shouldn't because they, they would just fuck it up. You know, you can meet white people and know you're never going to be friends the first time you see them. The world is a vampire. We didn't get to sit here yesterday. It was raining, so it'll be fun. My first pilgrimage of the day. I like to call it fancy things like pilgrimage because it makes me feel good. And no one seems to disagree with me. Anyone disagree? No? Okay. It's like the place that I got that was worth hiking all the way to get here. And you wouldn't really see much, but it just kind of opens up a bit here. And I found this nice log, and I've been sitting here for a while now, time after time. And I got a river stone. Look at the nature gave me some leaves. Hey! And, uh, hello. And, uh, stick I used to prop up my camera. Thank you. It's better than Jesus juice.
It was amazing. There was this one alone survival thing, and this woman, her calories were going down so low, they had to take her home. She didn't want to go. Which shows, as a white woman, how good she was at starving herself. You know, I could understand that. Like, I think I could, li I could live on a very low-calorie diet, you know? which tells you something about my childhood, you know. wasn't so bad, but I think it's less about food than more about nurturing and attention. Really, I mean, when you talk to white people about, oh, you know, he just needs attention, he just needs, there's never, until I read it in Arthur Janow's book the other day, you know, every child needs attention and love. He uses love and attention. It's like I learned that love was an abstract quality that Santa had to give me. Santa doesn't give me any attention, right? It's like a way for me to get attention for myself without distressing a real person in the demands that it might make upon them. And I found all of my friends were psychopaths and they really never gave me any attention either. Now I make a YouTube channel that no one pays attention to. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. Look, I'm really good at not getting any attention, eh? And I give myself attention through the imagination of uh, whatever. It's dangerous too. If you don't get enough attention, you're going to meet other people who've never had enough attention. And you know what's going to happen there, right? Oh. <coughs> Changing seasons. Here's to that. You never know what the day is going to bring. That's a neat thing about nature. This is just like a quiet little outpost for me. And then I can go down. And through the winter, if I want to keep walking, I could go down and I could probably walk all the way into Rath Trevor, um, which is probably safer than going this way. But uh, we'll see. I basically stayed away from the park there with a couple exceptions where I met crazy white people, I stay away from the park. And you meet like white women, the cougars are like white women who need a lot of attention. And if you don't give them the right kind of attention, um, they get angry. They can be very demanding. Like that woman on the sidewalk today, like singing out loud to her iPods, eye earbuds. You would think, oh, that's no big deal. But it's like, it's distracting. I can't do it. I'm not allowed to sing as I walk along the road. You know? She wasn't singing either until she got near me. And uh, I'm glad I don't have good eyesight, so I don't see people, but I sense people. Like, a lot of the white people down that road, they don't like saying hi to me, right? But I'm coming along to Butler, and there's two white people who do want to say hi to me. So, hello, hello, it's all good. But that's the first time since I started walking out here that anyone's actually said hello to me. They don't know that. But, you know, good for them. But, like... If I just walked by and ignored them and they said, oh, they'd be, what a pugnacious man. What a self-important, angry man. It's like, well, you know, people don't say hi to me when I say hi to them, but I have to say hi to them when they say hi to me. It sounds like a, a trivial thing, but it's not. You don't have to do anything wrong to be hurt by white people. They just, they've already got wrong going on 24 hours a day. Their lives and our lives are in some sense all wrong. Everything's already wrong. The universe is already wrong. Look at that sky though. What could be wrong with all of this? I've accepted that I was neglected. 
I accept it. It's a, it's a burden you carry the rest of your life. Other people, they, and I have, you, know, you get into religions and thoughts like, oh, you know, everything's fine, everything will be fine. And sure, you're going to have nice days. You, know? you can get PTSD just from being neglected. And uh, I realized the other day that my theory, psychototonic discharge theory, um, which is kind of like S, T, D, or P, FD, PSDT, or in a way, and it's like it's like PTSD. It's got the same letters. So um, you can't shock will never really completely go away. Neglect will never completely go away. But, you know, people try to make it go away through relationships, money, religion, positive thinking, exercise, drugs, you know, goals, or living in your magical forest, or smoking weed, or, you know, it's not like I'm not doing anything to make myself feel better, but it will never actually, my life will never actually be okay. And that's fine. You know, neglect, not everything, neglect is such a, a powerfully powerful issue and I think some people shouldn't solve it you know so that we can keep interested in the the general subject of neglect because it is a, a universal problem that the Bible and Christians seem to be very all religions seem to be very prepared for that every cult is very prepared oh come on in we're ready to make you happy sorry about the pain in the world Everybody in any cult I've been is all ready to like not have pain and be happy. And everyone's supposed to be nice to each other. And then they start picking on you. It's like, wait a second, I thought this was a, you know, one of the biggest comments I've made around white people is, I thought this was supposed to be a healthy place. I thought this was supposed to be about health. And, you know, it's not. It clearly isn't. I'm going to leave. Stupid me, right? And so you realize it's not. It's they're not really healing anything. But the gurus are always very well prepared for you. They saw you coming. Oh yeah. This one lady, the psychopath, told me that her guru saw her coming. She had dreams about him. Why do you think that is? Well, they, they were waiting for you. They probably saw you coming. There's one born every minute, apparently. And they feel special. There's something in the current of the guru, you know, like an anode or a cathode, and then out there, someone will have a dream about them, and they're the anode. In the, in the electronic world of psychopathy and cults, people do get drawn together, and you can get caught up. You can meet a psychopath, and they can take you on a whirlwind romance, and wake up one day, and you realize that everyone you know is a drug addict, and so are you. Why does that happen? Because the white world electronically favors exploiting neglect it electronically favors exploiting lovelessness in children right just because we're not children doesn't mean we can't be abused because of how we learn to adapt to a child eating electronic universe the electronics of the white world become like the mouth of saturn eating his own children it's very consumptive you can see that in the way white people talk about their childhood Either there's one bit of violence they talk about, like they've solved it, or there's nothing wrong with it at all, and it's all just absolute rainbows and, and puppy dogs. Now, I make the exception, you know, when people, people will say, well, when I was young, a family member died that I was really close to. You know, I respect that. I'm not saying, like, all pain is just, all it means is because you're getting abused by the world. There are really grief things that happen that, you know, everyone just deals with in their own way. And I respect that. I mean, you know, just because I have a lot of grief doesn't mean I know anyone else's grief but mine. And I don't want to talk ill of other people's, you know, also emotionally deep existence. Um, so it's just, it's my, my opinion. Right? And I'll try my best in my videos not to, you know, I'm covering, I get to cover quite a wide range, but also in that range, are people who don't deserve um, the way I treat subjects.
That's entirely possible. Because I'm not a I'm not delusional. I, I want to be a good person. I'd rather pro prove to the viewer that I'm a good person than try to prove to God. So you're you're my God. Like I said, I respect the white man. I'm terrified of the white man. I talk about the white man being a psychopath in the electronic world of psychopathy in a way that kind of balances out. You can see why everybody would be a psychopath, considering the electronics of personality development in white civilization, and particularly its language and religious systems. And economics, of course, you can throw that in as well. That's, you know, and connecting those, I think, is the work of a cultural anthropologist, an amateur version of one I call myself. To work between, I'm not going to use a bunch of gobbledygook, but to work between different fields of intelligence about groups and the different fields of intelligence and how individuals experience the world. From the perspective of someone like a guy on Survivor, like if I was on a Survivor alone show, and would be like, and I don't know how to survive. So would be like, oh, I'm out here and I don't know anything about survival, and that's going to help me survive what I don't know. <laughs> first, first day. I've got my coffee, <laughs> I'm going to smoke my cigarette, and I'm going to make a video. You know they have cameras, right? And they don't, usually don't like talking too much. I'd be like, they'd be like, contestant number three is talking all day long, and he hasn't looked for food, built a shelter, a rain comes, like, it's okay. I'm going to go hide under that rock <laughs> for like eight hours. I come out, it's like, oh, I got a little crick in my back. <laughs> it, it sounds like a breaking branch. <laughs> It's like, oh, I've got spinal lobifida. <laughs> I'm going to sue the producer for everything he's got. <laughs> so I, I think it's, I, I sometimes think, oh, that guy's not going to make it or that woman's not going to make it, you know, and I'm starting to watch these. I like, I don't even like Australians, but these people are pretty cool. You know, these Australians are pretty cool. So, which goes to show that I like nature people. And this one lady, you know, I didn't like her at first, you know, you know, her, you know yeah, but she was sitting on a log and she says, she starts going like this, and it's like, oh my God, she says, I'm so fat, I have to rock my body in order to stand up. She put on like 20, 30 pounds, right? So she could live off her own fat. I'm pretty sure it wasn't that hard for her. She looks like she's pretty heavy set anyway, but you know, good for you. I mean, that's what fat reserves are for, right? She's not out there like me to impress anybody. Her job is not to make little old Rain happy with himself. So. And she's doing pretty good. You know, once I got used to used to her, I thought, this woman really knows some stuff. You know, people talk like she's been helping people learn to live in the wilderness. And, and some of them, and I think also based on the location, like they're randomly given locations, you got to think that whatever, even tiny little niches three kilometers apart can be more or less difficult depending on the situation. And there are just certain random factors, right? Um, but also, you know, who you are, how you feel, where you're at in life, like everything. So. I'm learning like these guys that get sent off or they get sick or whatever, you know, it's like chances are I would be sent away the second day, you know, like I'd make it through day one and I'd be like demoralized and wet and I want to go home and see my mom. So you can't even text people, you know, it's like I'd, I'd have like a little thing like, mom, it's really wet um, and uh, I don't know what to eat. Like there's no refrigerators out here. <laughs> Where's the refrigerator? Ask the producer. Where's the stores? Where's the stores? <laughs> no stores out here. I was mistaken. I was misled. Yeah, I think that uh, neglect will always be a part of my life. I think it's a part of my personality. I think it's a part of who I am. I think what I've learned is you can be a lot happier, happier denying that fact, especially in groups. Which in a way, even if you're by yourself, you're probably practicing something you've read or heard, right? Which connects to other people. Um, and uh, you can do that, and it's nice. But I've learned that I would rather just be here. I'd rather just live my own life and go up and down and just see what that's like without a religion. Without something to prop myself up with. Except maybe a log and, well, obviously all the drugs I have around me. Uh, I think weed is, it's definitely been a really important part of my life. I don't think I would come out here without it. And it, it suits someone who has neglect. It suits someone with shock. Weed is, or can be good with PTSD. Did you just see that? There was like a little, I thought it was a purple fairy coming out over there. 
Let's not forget the purple fairies. They've been around me now. They've gotten closer. And they're telling me my heart, my heart is better. Maybe I'll meet a female deer. <laughs> and we'll become friends. I'll feed them apples. They'll feed me chocolate. We can be friends every day in the forest. We can make trails and make poop side by side. <laughs> <laughs> you can have a whole video. <laughs> like, you come back ten years later, you're like, what happened to this dude? He's like, he just doesn't want to ever be popular. What's his problem? I found looking somewhat homeless is a good idea, but it also attracts unwanted attention, helps you blend in. That's probably why a lot of homeless people don't mind looking like homeless people, because it kind of... people put you in a different category. I'm impressed when white people talk to me and they don't ask me if I'm homeless. I've had a few of them. I had one guy offer me 10 bucks. <laughs> I threw it back in his face. I said, I have a job. Leave me alone. And he'd been stalking me outside a grocery store. Probably for more than one day. Interesting, the number 10. It was the first day I put on a white sock my psychopathic father had given me while he was stalking my mother during her 60s. And it was one white sock and I rolled up my pants and I made a video saying, this is for the victims of all violent crime. And within 15 minutes, I was attacked, I was stalked by this man. Right across the street was an actual homeless person. Why didn't he, right on the side of the highway, why didn't he give his $10 to him? Right, why not? He must have passed him on the way into the store. He had to. He was sitting right on the corner where you, the only place you can really come in, right? Isn't that interesting? Why not give his money to him? I had another man stalk me out there. Just sit there, stare at me. Vortexes. You know, any places where a hump like this feels comfortable is a place that I learned I shouldn't feel comfortable. You know? So I don't mind being a little uncomfortable out here because I don't have to be around the people who would be comfortable out here. I don't have to be around people who would or would not be comfortable spending time with me. I like Robert. I talked about him this morning. He was, his energy was really grounded. You can see he stays away from people a lot. Doesn't smoke weed. He would just sit quietly on the side of the beach. One of the only people I've ever met besides myself who just go somewhere and sit and just enjoy the nature. You just don't see that much. I was hoping to see a little sun by now, but... I wouldn't want to live outdoors. It's too cold. My family badly injured me at one point in my life. After uh, many years and months of built up stalking, uh, directed by my father, onto someone I, I expect that by birth, myself, um, was already virtually non existent to him. And the encroachment of my merest existence, I think once it became something he had to concern himself with, was something he wanted nothing to do with. And uh, so imagine that kind of person. You know? It's like someone who's there, but they're not there. 
and then it's like they go away one day and they come back and they're like some awful man that hates you and doesn't care if you die. But nothing's ever explained. It's more of a primal, there's primal factors involved, right? If you want to use your words and just say, please don't hurt me or this, they'll hold that against you. There's nothing you can say, nothing you can do. You're trapped in a cell with a grief-stricken primal psychopath. It doesn't matter what they did, what they didn't do. Their entire attitude is dangerous, you know. If it's not physical, at some point it will be. They're building up husks of narratives about you. Friends of theirs tend to humiliate you. No one seems to get a good idea about you. You know this, he's able, he's able to do this to your mother, even respect her own family. So it, it's very enlightening about how white Christians treat their children, or at least their siblings, and, and what they call love. And my dad was able to do this around my mother's brothers and sisters with total impunity, you know? It's like, you know, I don't think they're terribly close. I don't think my mom ever expected anything from them. That was the benefit of being raped when she was five. I guess you don't expect anything at that point. I guess it becomes kind of a good thing. If you're born to white Christians, hope they rape you in the first five years. It'll save you all the trouble of never otherwise being able to get your brain into gear to be able to deal with the fear of being around them. And so my mom didn't see her best friend as a sociopath. Went to a nice school in Canada, worked for the government, always seemed to have good jobs. Always seemed to be in control, good with people, knows people, invited her to parties, lived with her for a while. Next thing you know, she's coming to see her in England. And you got to meet these people. You got to meet this guy Vic, and Vic is a high energy psychopath who wants to get his younger brother Alan laid. And both of them conspire to make sure my mom's no isn't accepted multiple times to get them to go out. Once my dad has access to her, it's over. Once they break down, once you say no to someone and they break that down, then what does it matter what you say no to? My mom didn't know that her best friend was a sociopath. Her best friend didn't know she was a sociopath and probably most of you wouldn't know she's a sociopath and it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, good for us. It doesn't matter until it matters. It doesn't matter until everyone's dead and you're left there and it's like, oh, suddenly it matters. It's like a thread on Reddit or something, I don't go there, Maybe, like where you see, like, or in the comments, like you see people talking for like 500 messages or 499 messages, and then suddenly someone says something that sums up everything and is the real truth of the entire situation. And no one's around to read it and nobody gives a shit. The truth eventually comes out, you see. And so you've got to see what comes out of a family. You've got to see what's remaining when everything else is gone. And then you see what that is. Right? And that's the thing that white people like cancer hold inside their families forever. And no one touches it, no one talks about it, and it gets delivered. And your, the idea is you're supposed to sort of wrap it up like it's a tiny baby and protect it, even from other babies that allow you to neglect the needs and feelings of other people whenever you need to, as though part of a football team. That suddenly the person you're facing is on the other team and you can just tackle them verbally whenever you want to. To protect the baby. Gotta protect the baby. You start protecting a parasite instead of anyone else, even yourself. But as long as you're on, as you're on the winning side, hey, the casino of the football universe always seems it's it's like it seems like the only game in town. So my my dad had verbal, social, psychological and as far as he could, I think, economic control of my mom, who thankfully liked to earn her own money. And that was why she was able to leave him. 
I remember helping her study for her exams for car insurance, complimentary, supplementary, whatever. She was really good at it, and I really supported her. I knew she was happy. And I was the only one in her life that cared that she was happy. When my mom's happy, I'm happy. <coughs> and she left to give her a chance to escape my dad. It left me kind of alone with him, but, <coughs> you know, that wasn't her fault. She had to escape. He's a maniac. He's a really nice, charming British maniac. I mean, he could do anything. He has no morals. He's not going to rape you. But, you know, it's a different story for people like me and my mom. And anyone he's ever known would say, I don't know who you're talking about. It's not just a disease, it's like a personality complex that develops in different, if complementary, ways among all white people. And then you end up with something like my friendships that where there's nothing there. There's nothing there. One of the most insulting things is this gay white man I knew. I went back and saw him in his 40s. And he said something. He said that he told someone that we had met as friends during swimming lessons. The key word, of course, is that he saw me during swimming lessons in like 1976, when I was four years old. Because I have no recollection of him whatsoever. But to hear him tell the story, it's like we became instant best friends. It's really weird. And what I think is that he actually started stalking me. That's all that's happening. It's amazing that no part of our relationship is real, and the earliest part of it is the most delusional. And you would think, well, maybe he's just a child, right? But none of that has changed. He's never interested in me through our 20s. Doesn't matter where I'm working. I've met other white people like this. Doesn't matter what you're doing. Your life changes, your hair changes, your clone changes, your religion fucking changes. They don't care. They can just come into your house and go, I don't see anything except the need to talk about myself and then leave. I don't see anything but the need to talk to myself and then leave. Yeah. If I was a narcissist, I'd think I was some kind of guru. You know? And I just I just give my life away, life away. Go ahead, tell me all about yourself, cause I can't hear enough about how you are. Da -da -da your problems, your loves, and your passions, as they feel to you ever. And I will just sit like a rubber tree plant, da, 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 like a rubber tree plant, da, la, la. And I'll go off by myself in the woods, and I'll sing songs to other crazy people on YouTube, like a rubber tree plant. <laughs> and I, I, I never had anyone to talk to. None of these people, despite how friendly they are, ever asked me so much as how I felt, how my day was. Nothing. Ever. Right? Nothing. From to this day, if I ever say to someone, hey, how are you? In the street or whatever, sometimes they say, hey, how's it going? I really am open, if something's wrong, for someone telling me. I'm available. I'm available if you're in some kind of distress. How's it going? I'm available. You know? Sometimes part of me has to come forward and say, I'm available because I am available. I was born available to this world. We're all available. You're available. I'm available. We're, you know, we like living. There's one guy on the show alone. He said the most beautiful thing. He said, it's great to be alive. It's, it's, it's great, isn't it, to be alive? It is really great. And the way he said it, you know, he just caught a fish. He'd been hungry for two days. Hey, it's great to be alive. There's an honest man. But I think he ends up going home because he's getting anxious. He's got PTSD. But I'm really happy he got that experience. I thought, right on, man. I would, I'd be happy for me if I went there and I made it three days and I caught a fish and boiled it and called in and on the satellite phone, went home, had a juicy steak, got into my bed, took a few hot baths, made a YouTube video. Hey, I'm back from, you probably couldn't tell anybody for like a year. But um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Glad he had a nice experience. I thought the native guy would last longest, but he said it was too cold for him. His people had never lived like this.
That's fair enough. Yeah. To each person, be honest, right? Be honest to yourself, you know? And that's where it's not about winning and losing. It's about honesty. It's always about honesty. And, you know, if I came out here to make a romantic video about nature and a man's quest for healing in the world, and, you know, a squirrel came up and bit me in my jugular vein and I died or something, you know, that'd be hilarious. Because <laughs> squirrels don't do that. But, you know, it turns out someone actually fed and trained and, and set a... a, a crazy squirrel into the woods with my scent and it just turns into a big to-do made for TV movie you know maybe uh, Jennifer Lawrence stars in it she's the person who trains the squirrel but she doesn't know what she's doing because the whole operation is compartmentalized and she feels really bad at the end of the day I and mean, she's like and she goes back and watches all of my videos and cries <laughs> the world lost such an important man I gave him the wrong furry squirrel. <laughs> she would start talking to her crotch. <laughs> yes, he is nice, isn't he? <laughs> the rolling stone gathers no nuts. <laughs> the rolling stone has no nuts, but it does have a big stone. So it's all the nuts you need. <laughs> What if like men were impotent and doctors just said, hey, look, get a big stone and just tie it around your neck. <laughs> and then every time it hits you in the balls, you can say to people, hey, that doesn't hurt. <laughs> it's like I have a vagina. <laughs> have your balls removed just so you can freak people out. It's like, look at that. I feel nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I can jump on a bike with no seat with no problem. Oh, wait, there is a problem. So, to go back, uh, yes, my, my family severely injured me. And I, I haven't quite recovered from it. Physically, but, you know, but it's been good. Like I, some of my headaches have gone, and my body seems to make it another ring around the, the sun and uh, which it is you know the earth seasons is like a ring around the sun it's not a ring like an orbit it's a ring like a sound around the sun the sun is like a ring around the sun instead of a ring around the posy right not a ring around your vein your venus amortis And the vein and the venus, which is a Christ, which is part of the currency of the bank. So your veins really carry the currency of the bank. The vein is the currency of the vein. They tap the main vein. Don't use God's name in vain because he owns all the veins. He wants you in nothing but his language to poison your blood. Because he looks like it's I think God acts like, like a vampire, like our blood is more useful to God than it is to us. When a Christian assaults me, it's like my time is worth more to them than it is to me. You have to consider when you talk to people that their time is worth as much to them as your time is worth to you. But if you're brain damaged and your time maybe isn't worth that much to you, or maybe you can only respect my time as much as you, know, you can respect your own time. So if someone disrespects my time, I think they're out of their mind. I think like you should use your mind better. then you'd respect a man's time. I knew a mentally ill white man. White parents beat him, left him for dead, that type of thing. He lives in his car and spends all his time by himself. And I would see him after eight, nine hours walking, and he would always waste my time, <laughs> sometimes quite cruelly. And I would let him, because I could. And I think I saw something good in him, as one does from time to time. But eventually, you know, you can't keep doing that. Because he didn't respect my time. He didn't respect what I was doing with my time. Like, hey, you spend all your time alone, so do I. 
Let's respect that. He couldn't see that I had a life of my own. He would never ask me about my day. He would make sure he started humiliating me about my penis, my body, my face, and then would start talking about himself. I think he considered it breaking balls because he doesn't really know how to be a man. And he talks about sex like someone who read it in a book, which is how I would talk about sex. You're like, I could smell her and the room was, the room was just full of a kind of must. It was like a, an antique shop with Angela Lansbury and I found an old phone from 1950 and I tried to ring Eisenhower <laughs> and he wasn't home. But Angela, Miss Lansbury came up behind me and she put on a gray shawl over my shoulders and said, come with me, dear. <laughs> and like, that's the least sexual story in the history of the world. There's nothing sexual about it, but that's, you know, what do I know? <laughs> I like antique shops. I like antiquing. You know what I, the main thing I like most about antique shops? Old books. They have some of the coolest old books in these places, you know? Old English poetry book or something. That's the best. That's the best thing. If someone was my gay partner, he'd be like, Where's your little book there, Rain? <laughs> Did you find your little book? Did you find your little book, my... My lover boy. <laughs> I'm not sure. Hey, is you is or is you ain't my baby. It's like when I look at my crap, I always know it's my crap. A translation, is this my deuce or ain't it my deuce? I must deduce the situation. I'm the only one here. <laughs> I was sitting down for a moment. There was a moment of pleasure and then back to the incredible disappointment that I am to my father. <laughs> Fortunately though, this I can wipe away. <laughs> incredible violence. And I've never been an expert, never thought I was an expert. But I, I, I've used my mind as best as I could to kind of comprehend the incomprehensible. I mean, no, no one person can comprehend the shocks that can be meted out to a human body uh, over and over again, and the concussions and the impressions and how that's going to affect a human life. And that's part of the horror of it, because the people involved don't care about any of the effects it has on you, and they never will. And it will always make you question everything about their love, because it's like, how could someone that cares about you do this to you? How could someone that cares about you do this to you? How could someone that cares about you do this to you? Right? And, uh, <clears throat> and you live with that every day. It's like the ring of death. You're alone. You've been forced to be alone. And you've been violently expelled from your original herd. And you're a homebody. And you're 150 pounds soaking wet. And your favorite thing to do is go to the library and read books by L. Ron Hubbard. This is your life, right? And now you're being physically left for dead in your home. You've literally done everything you could your entire life to survive, and lo and behold, it didn't work. And now, but at least, something has finally happened. Because when you're stalked, or when you're, if you're just feeling, if you're, a lot of people are abused and they don't know they are, and you found some safe pot spot in the world, and now they found a way to really hurt you because you're, when you get away from a narcissistic family or a narcissist, that's when the temptation, like it can be the most violent. I find that with right roommates. You know, the last two days there are, they're always at their worst. <laughs> Why is that when they have to leave? Why is it that white people get so psychotic before they stop being roommates with me? It's like, it's a fascinating thing. And it's happened to all of them throughout my life. <laughs> No matter what age or sex or gender. Well, sound like I'm an awful person. And uh, maybe if it helps, I'll say it. They're not an awful person. I just, I don't have enough knowledge to accommodate what these people need, much less what I need, what the world needs. And I think a lot of people could have done different things and said different things. They probably wouldn't have had the same thing happen to them. But that's my point. You know, it puts them and it puts me, you know, on the hot seat. And it doesn't feel good.
You don't want that to happen to you. When someone says, I don't want them to happen, and it happens all the time, you kind of question the health of their mind. You say, Rain, this all happened. You know, and part of that is shock. Part of that is, like my mom marrying my dad, she had no way, you know, with what she's surrounded by and what her family was like and what my dad helped to reveal about everyone around my mom, wonderful person, is that she really did an amazing job surviving to this day. And in all the pain and the bitterness, and there's a lot, and sorrow and grief and ruination, there is this lamp of truth, you know. She survived, and I survived enough to appreciate how she survived. My mom is a survivor. She's a survivor of an extremely abusive family, particularly, you know, the males and the females. Her parents actually are quite nice. You know, she didn't get a chance to work out things with them because her brothers raped her. Now, certainly that is a family ordeal. And certainly, you know, there are many different reasons why I think Christianity, and, and my mom really suggested this, was the worst part about it. When a victim of assault, a sexual assault at five years of age, tells who doesn't really like to talk about these things, tells you that the worst part about it that got between her and her dad and her family was Christianity, you tend to listen. And my mom's not an anti-Christian. I, but I promote it in my household. I promote anti-Christianity. I absolutely do. I'll tell you something else about my body. I got out of bed today, and when I had a cold a month ago or so, I felt like I had rigor mortis in my muscles. And it might be a thing, maybe there's a doctor out there, where my muscles actually seem to get so stiff, it's like I'm dead. I woke up this morning around my shoulders and I thought, I feel like my body is like, like I've been a corpse for the last three hours, you know? And my, my mom said to me, she's very intuitive, she said, well, you probably didn't move around enough. I'm like, okay, that's true. <coughs> that's a very good point. <coughs> I tossed and turned a lot of those nights and, and then I wake up and then I fall asleep and then I just fall dead asleep. Maybe that's why they call it dead asleep. And I said, I guess I'll stretch a bit. I was talking just now, and I could feel it creep into my left shoulder. It was like, my shoulders tend to hunch forward, almost like I'm in the womb. It seems like I'm just preparing to die. Like something is already, death had got into me inside the womb. It's a kind of emotional rigor mortis. It's really gross, isn't it? Like I've got a tooth that's been basically dying away. Basically dying on the root, and I'm letting it. My sister saw me, and she said, "Oh, you, my mom, you should—he should get uh, go to the dentist." You know, and I said, "And it's very unflattering." I thought, "Ah, I'm gonna leave it." I'm kind of glad because then I can see what inside my mouth needs to rot. <laughs> it's the only part of my mouth that's rotting. I I take really good care of my teeth, and it's always been a tooth. I was—it was the one tooth I was a little unsure about, you know, for many many years. And it looked—it didn't look like it wanted to hang on, and it's like. You know, I have two teeth from when I was a child, but I, this one's, and um, that's fine. I can afford to lose it. Um, people don't need to like my smile. I figure if you look at my smile, you could see all the other teeth that are perfectly fine, or you could see the one that isn't. You know, it's like an IQ test. You know, I think it's an IQ test. You know, ah. You know, if you look at, I look at white people's face. A lot of white people are ugly like me, and you're like, you have to, I've said white, I have to get used to looking at them. It's like, what part of your face can I look at that doesn't disgust me? <laughs> I think that people do that to me too. I'm like, they're like, hi, oh, you have such a nice aura all around you. <laughs> don't look at his jacket, don't look at his face, don't look at the holes in his shoes, don't look at his crotch. He's given me nothing to look at. <laughs> Maybe his hair. There's nothing wrong with looking ugly. I'm gonna look ugly as I get older. I'm prepared for that. I'm gonna get uglier. But I'm gonna do it with grace. <laughs> and lots of marijuana. <laughs> this woman, this nice woman that's surviving in Australia, she's not the most beautiful looking person. But damn it, she looks like someone who should be in a, in a book about Neolithic women. I'm really starting to really believe in her. Yeah, she's got she's got real staying power. There's another there's a couple other women too. I think they're all pretty good. I do. There's an ecologist, there's her. I don't know all their professions. Quite frankly, it's what I watch at the end of my day, so I don't pay a lot of attention to the details, but 
uh, the ecologist seems, you know, she says really nice things. Like she says, like, I don't want to start off here because she needs to eat, like just killing, killing and destroying things. I live my life to preserve things. So I don't, I don't really feel like doing that. I'm not really into that right now, but kind of suggesting like, obviously if I get hungry, I'm going to have to get a little more aggressive about how I go about surviving. So I thought oh, that was kind of cool describing her attitude. It's not unreasonable. It's like, not like, oh, I'm just not going to kill anything until I die. But it's like, I'm really not busting to be destructive. You know, we'll see how it goes. Let's try to, you know, go as peaceful as we can along the way. I thought that was pretty cool. Kind of like Owen Oak. That's a nice, I like that approach. You know, it might not be the best approach for everyone, but it might turn out well for her. The other guy's like, oh, I'm going to hunt right away and get some meat. And he spends two or three days just trying to hunt. And he finds absolutely nothing. He walks around with an axe and a stick. He's like, I'm going to kill something, hunt something, stab something, grab something, smell something, stalk something. He says, I'm a professional hunter. I'm the best at what I do. And finds absolutely nothing. Gets really piss angry, falls over, hurts his knee, and then leaves. And it's like, okay, no, I mean, I respect the guy because, like, he's teaching me something. It's like, you know. It's too bad that he didn't find anything, but it's like, it's like in a way he sort of scared it away without feeling like the nature didn't want to feed him. And that's what she does. He wants you to go away like a woman, you go away. I think that's a little unfair because, you know, that's not necessarily the case, but I thought, well, you've given yourself a really hard task for Mother Earth loving you, you know? Just like if I was there, how long, you know, maybe it's not about that, you know? The other guy's like, he's making tools, he's making a kayak, he's like, I don't need to worry about a shelter right away, fire right away, I'm perfectly happy just going to work engineering the tools I need, like an earth base, to start, you know, going about a more extensive and articulate range of the industry of, of living. I, I'm really looking forward to see what this guy does. You know? He seems really cool. He's got a real engineering mindset, so I think it's neat to see these different styles, you know. And it's, it, he's not waiting for Mother Nature to love him. He looks like someone who's already been loved. He's a white person who has enough love, so he's not waiting for Mother Nature to tell him, like, when he can cut a tree down. <laughs> but he's making good choices. He's not looking to just hang anything down. He's like, I'm gonna, this is the purpose. I'm, he's telling us, he's telling, this, telling nature. As a good engineer, it's like, okay, this is, I want to use this tree. I do, because it's going to serve this purpose. It's perfect for that. I don't want to just, you know, use any, I'm going to use it. It's going to be put to good use, and this is what I'm going to use it for, and it's going to be the pivotal to the rest of my survival, so that's what I'm going to do, and boom, you know. He's not saying, oh, I can't wait to kill this thing. You know, he's saying, this is what I'm doing. He's submitting a petition to nature, it's like, and he's showing us, look, He's showing us the judgment of man, like good use. The ecologist is not just being ecologist to nature, she's being an ecologist to us. We are also the judge, right? Do we want these people to survive? You know, the guy that's angry, he doesn't make me want to spend time with him. He spends his whole time hating where he is, which does not look like a very appealing place. I don't like the idea of walking in mud all day long either. So, but maybe if he came back three years later to the same place in the summer, it'd be different. So, it's like that. You know, when you go places, times a year, it's really different. You know? I do understand that surviving in a random place selected for you, even if you've got skills, it's telling you it could be impossible still. Depending on your skill set. So, my skill set is pretty much nothing. But I'm going to go with the engineer guy right now. I like him. You know, we could be like dudes. I could do things for him. He'd be like, uh, get me a stick, Rain. It's like, oh, here you go. <laughs> I'd be his apprentice. <laughs> hey, are we going to eat soon? Yeah, yeah. Stop asking that. <laughs> That's why we're building the kayak. Is there room for two? No, only me, the hunter. Oh, too bad. I guess I'll sit here and mine the fire. Yeah, you do that, Rain. <laughs> Bring back a lot of fish. Oh, I will. <laughs> I fall asleep, the fire goes out, he comes back, it's like, hey, did you get any fish? No, and you let the fire go out. <laughs> Pretty soon, like day five, I'm not there anymore. <laughs> There's a little stone erected in my name. Uh, what happened? Oh, he fell, he, he died in his sleep. 
<laughs> they find some handprints over my face. <laughs> because I'm useless. That's what I'm saying. I'm useless. Useless. <laughs> well, not everyone's useless. I, if uh, I could be a wedge, <laughs> be a good doorstop. <laughs> You know, I could open and close a door for you. And when I open doors for women, sometimes they don't like it, but it's like they don't realize that's the only thing that I can do in society. You know, and I'm bestowing that upon thee. <laughs> you don't realize how precious it is. There are people who be like, whoa, Rain's doing something useful for someone. Wow. <laughs> yeah. No, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I don't think I'd sign up for that, but I'd like a different version for people like me, you know? Like a pod of 10 people on a giant game reserve, just, I think the, the, the aspect, what it would isolate and what all these people are going through is the psychological component or the mental component, being alone, um, having time to think, um, what some people might call disassociating, you know, just like, where am I? You know? I think that's like someone told me that they traveled so much they'd come into an airport and they wouldn't know what country they're in is that dissociating or is that just like grounding right letting yourself know that you're not entirely sure where you are in life or anywhere for any reason right allows your mind to just spin it's like it's got like a viscous fluid just like an eyeball your brain is like an eyeball and it has organs like viscous ethereal organs and if you're moving around a lot or life has just been tremendous or life just ever was shocking enough. I find walking through the forest and smoking weed, at some point you just, you feel like different levels of your mind are clicking in. And at some point, feeling completely lost is not unexpected, which something might be called dissociating. Like, where am I? Like a part of your mind just woke up, like, where do you think you are? You're in the forest. Oh, oh, it's lovely, thank you. I'm happy. <laughs> Or, oh my God, I'm alone in life, and this is all I do all day. <laughs> Where am I? What am I doing? <laughs> but that never happens to me. <laughs> I feel that in the background, but it doesn't motivate me. I'm just like, oh my God, I better get a job. That never happens. And so after 50 years of life and I never go, oh my God, I better get a job, you gotta think, I probably don't wanna get a job. <laughs> Considering my life. It's like, I wish, I think my dad, I think my dad finally believes me. I don't wanna get a job. <laughs> But it doesn't mean I don't want to be useful. I like to follow the drum of my own drool. The drum of, I like to follow the trail of my own drool. You know? I like to see where it flows. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ool. <laughs> Dr. Ool, Dad. I'm Dr. Ool. That's just another word for drool, my son. <laughs> what are you doing? Drivel. <laughs> Drivel. I like drivel. It's got drive and it's got L. <laughs> drive L. Drive L. Drive L. What are you doing? I am driving L. <laughs> I need two L's. Now I've got two feet. Now I can walk on water. <laughs> Playing, walking on water is a play on words for God's name as he hovers over the waters and takes the name of Isis, or the name of the Sacred Feminine, the Mother Tongue. Converts it into a kind of abstract void, and then everything that he names, he declares it to be divided, right? And nothing is created, but it's divided and dead. So God's like, well, make the night divided and dead, the waters divided and dead, the earth divided and dead, Adam and Eve divided and dead. Donate the fruit of the language of all that is divided and dead, <laughs> because then you'll realize, like I do, <laughs> that everything's divided and dead, but that'll allow me to take what life anyone ever has and force it to put into my divided dead universe forever as a kind of tax for the burden that every organ of creation undertook, which belongs to me, to fashion for you anything you've ever enjoyed about life, or ever will, or any happiness anyone ever finds in heaven and earth. <laughs> All mine. Thank you. <laughs> Don't you love it? What's love but a second-hand emotion? You just have to follow God's thoughts. He took the trouble to lay them out in the Bible 
When a psychopath hurts someone, he has to tell you what's on his mind. So God throws the book at us. He tells us his language, his mind. He has to tell it to us. In order to work magic, you have to tell people what the magic is. There's the revelation of the method. To work the magic of words, you have to tell the object what you're doing. Because you have to tell him what, how, what, what you're doing in a way that shuts off certain organs and powers in his mind and the relationship of his mind and any and all relationships within the scope of the mind of the organs of his birth, his home, or heritage, and an entire connection of thousands of years to the earth. And suspend it. <laughs> and confound it. And tell it the truth, but like you're watching it on TV, suspend your ability to do anything and anything about it. So it's like a silent alarm. It goes into the void. Right? So Ella Ella now starts to eliminate. Eliminates things. It eliminates itself. It divides and eliminates everything. Ella Ella. It divides everything into a ring like a language of death and violence and conflict, right? That is fundamentally the violence of separating mother from child and man from his own mind, okay? Now you've got him where you want him, displaced, alone, disconnected from the universe, and guilty for causing that disconnection because of his disobedience to God. It's so that he does something that introduces death for the first time into a world that's otherwise completely joyful and full of nothing but life. Does that make sense? And then God says that Satan takes everything beautiful and makes it ugly, whereas God takes everything ugly and makes it beautiful. Really, and think about that. God made everything ugly, God makes everything ugly, and makes everyone ugly to each other. So that everything about birth or labor now becomes about a tax which carries with it through the breath capturing and the oxygen starving language of English. So it becomes anoxic and it becomes anaerobiotic, which means tending toward the living off of the energy of other things to supply what is lost with the lack of oxygen to the brain, the lack of attention to the child. So you get the ring of death. The orbits of the planet becomes the rings of Mercury, the rings of death, the rings of Uranus, the nuclear rings, the Venus Amortis with which we marry each other by putting a ring on a finger dedicated to nothing but the vein or the love of death. Amore. The word for love and the word for death are the same. Um, well, the sun's coming. And I'm cold. I'm getting old and I'm getting cold. Yeah, it's been nice. Uh, nature's been really good to me today. My mom and I are like two spirits who wandered into each other. I think we're the only two really fortuitous people we've ever met. My sister is pretty harsh. My younger brother is ambivalent. My older brother is married to a cunning psychopath and himself is come by it, I guess, as honestly as he could. Um, friends, neighbors, most of my mom's, you know, people pass away or they go away. I mean, my mom and I are all each other really has in the world. We looked at Sirius today, so that was nice for the heart. Sirius seemed to have something to say. That's great. We saw Orion.
great man. It's kind of neat that we have a constellation that preserves masculinity in the sky. Yeah. But also femininity, like the, the hunter could be the huntress, Deanna. But Deanna itself in English basically means divided unto death. So it's got the ring of death to it. I like the name Diana personally, and it's the basis of the word divine. You got the vine, you got the wine, you got the current, you got the vein, the vein of death, right? The divine. Diviana, the vein of death. Again, the ring of death. The ring of Saturn, 1111. Of Santa Claus, Père Noel, Père Noel. In England, we called him Father Christmas. <laughs> He's so good, we call him Dad. Imagine a big fat man that has children line up to sit on him, and they say, "Hey, Dad." Imagine if you had a video of children coming up to me and going, "Hey, Dad." Like men looking at their children come up to me, it's like, "Hey, Dad," and look at the look on their face. It's like, <laughs> they love me more than you. Because I give them things, or at least they think I do. <laughs> all, I, all I do is rent this cheap suit so I can get a boner over children every day. <laughs> I mean, it's weird, right? Hey, Dad, hey, Dad. I didn't think Santa was my dad when I went to the mall. I never wanted to do it again. I sit on his fucking lap. Jesus Christ, man. A lap is a pretty intimate place to be, hence the term lap dance. You have to pay these women to sit in your lap, <laughs> right? Where Santa gets it for free. He's getting a lap dance from your infant children. Bouncing and they're crying. Hey, I don't wanna I don't wanna be near this man's cock. Oh, I don't understand you why you're crying. I work so hard to love you. Because white people, when a child is born, they eliminate their children's power of reasoning, without which they couldn't have been born in the first place. And then they call Jesus the truth and the way, right? Because right? Jesus replaces, I think, anything but death that has any value to God being born when we are. It's kind of odd, isn't it? So they eliminate um, their voice, their breath, their spirit, because your spirit really is your pneuma, your breath, so the spirit of reason. So they eliminate the child's spirit. It gives you some idea of why children, white children are anoxic. They have signs of anoxia. That's part of why there's so much psychopathy. You can see it in their eyes, their stupid grins sometimes. Like, a lot of white people have brain damage. It's just acculturated brain damage. Drinkers lobotomize themselves. I mean, life's hard enough already. I mean, I don't drink. I've probably seen brain damage to people, right? But it's like, it's hard enough already without, like, working to damage your brain. They give their dogs more voices than their children have. The, the children can't complain. They can't know something is wrong by the way they cry or look for very long and, and across a wide range, especially to do with Santa Claus, right? Santa Claus is the most likely person in a white child's life that who, whom you could be terrified of and cry, but that doesn't, disinhib that doesn't inhibit the white mother from forcing the child to sit on their lap and try to quiet them down a stranger's lap. She's willing to stretch her credulity and her sense of safety for her child almost out towards the stars in a way like, if I picked up your child and they screamed, what would you do? You would scream bloody murder and you would get them out of my fucking arms. You'd kick me in the balls and punch me in the fucking head and probably call the police. But Santa, you say thank you and you put five bucks in his fucking bucket. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is why I like to go to the mall during Christmas and have a couple of cappuccinos. <laughs> Just a little small talk about saying, <laughs> like, look at this, look at this dude. He's taking paternity away from these people and they fucking love him for it. But like I said this morning, it's all part of the same system, right? It's all part of the same cult. 
it's really it's really the same as the Jesus cult. It's the language of the almighty dollar. You know? Santa really could reveal everything. He could be like, Santa reveals all, <laughs> according to me. <laughs> Anonymous. People read it. It's like, I think this is Rand Griffin. It's like, no, his name is Neri Norfke. <laughs> Neri Norfke. It's Neri Norfke. No, it's not. It's Rand Griffin. No, it's Neri Norfke wrote it. I did not write that. I don't take any credit for that. It says Nori Norfke. <laughs> That's obviously your name. It's not. It's got a picture of you on the back. No, it doesn't. That's not me. <laughs> well, do you look like some homeless dude with a toothless grin and a smile on his face that begs somebody to punch him in the face? <laughs> no, that's not me. <laughs> Call my publisher. I want a new name. <laughs> I want bear butt rider. Bear butt rider, that's it. Bear butt rider. Why Santa is dead. <laughs> Santa is the Lord of the dead. Why you should stop writing his name on presents to your children. <laughs> but also, <laughs> Merry Christmas <laughs> from my family to yours. <laughs> <laughs> the guy who killed Santa, you know. <laughs> Not literally, you know, because there's too many of them. <laughs> They're like Tom Cruise in uh, Oblivion. <laughs> they make them. They make new ones all the time. I almost think that if I can be happy out here today, I can be happy in some way for the rest of my life. Sometimes. That's the goal. You know, if something, if I can find some happiness in this day, hopefully throughout the course of my life, I will find a greater and greater happiness that will speak the same language as the happiness of today. So instead of English, the language of death, imagine the language of happiness. Like nature and the language of happiness being our true life. The life with the greatest, if ineffable, religious, abstract promise in the most universally customized personal way to every living creature. So that in enjoying it, we would also be connecting to all life. <laughs> Wouldn't that be neat? And you do a little dance like, ooh, I like this language. I feel like a fairy <laughs> that fairies already speak this language. Which is why they live so long, but also stay away from people because they're like half dead mongrel retarded bonobo apes. <laughs> you know, they wouldn't say that, but I will. <laughs> a white man lives in a different dimension. A whole sense of time, you know. I come out here to change dimensions. You can go on a vacation and get on a plane. You can go to fucking outer space if it even exists. But I like to change dimensions. And I found when I would go for a long walk, sometimes, you know, like, sometimes in childhood, you might think, like, you had a magic moment. And in that moment, another dimension, not just angels, but a whole other dimension took over and something became possible that wouldn't normally be possible. And it stays with you the rest of your life. And really, if you want to think about happiness as a language, every one of those days must have been speaking it. And what did you do? Did you practice some special ritual? Did you say some special words? It's not really enlightenment, but it is the language of happiness. And I think that's, that's a lot closer to enlightenment than a lot of things it would be the language of happiness. You know, and I would like to, I'd like to learn that language, nature. I'd like to learn that language today and every day the rest of my life. And uh, my mother is a big part of that language. 
it's in a way its greatest use in my life would probably be keeping me and my mom alive because I think it is the language of life itself and life is always interested in keeping us alive you know life really is the dominant theme not death but in English language death is all there is it's an elimination based society right it's like it's like our story of evolution it's an elimination death oriented looking at what any standard of signs related to anything real knowledgeable or worth worshiping or paying or buying um, can be in the Western world forever so you're getting out of a time trap you're getting away from a black hole made out of a certain kind of language time system Western civilization is like a kind of architecture. It's practicing a, practicing a kind of alchemical magic, an invisible prison, an electronic level over all human beings in North America. So you have to step out of that dimension every now and then. Come out of the casino and take a breath of fresh air, where not everything is about earning your place in heaven or anywhere else. You know, you just earn your place in a forest, you know? in a place in your own heart, you know, just let your mind, the different organs of the mind start to stir and spin and stop, you know. Imagine a dryer that had a loose belt that was making a sound like ours do, but somehow it could correct itself, you know. You just had to take the dryer for a walk. Something in the ethers of life that if as much as the language of happiness is about life, it's about the mind getting enough air. It's never to be taken for granted that we're getting enough air. Air is something that we all need. Like if you looked at every human life and some kind of infinite intelligence could say how much and what kind of air you needed today, not just your calories or, you know, your minutes online or money or food, but also just air, how much air you need. And that should never be taken for granted. What if every person had enough air every day? Is everyone getting enough air? You know, I, I go to Walmart. It's a nice store, but I tell my mom, I gotta leave, you know, our apartment in the morning. You know, it gets really stuffy. I gotta leave. It doesn't have enough air. I've gotten used to large quantities of fresh air every day, which is gonna help me live longer, you know? But it also makes the trouble, the only real trouble with it is it gets your, along with marijuana, it gets your brain working really well. And that can be a real problem, you know? And you may not notice it, but it can be a problem for other people, <laughs> right? Because everyone's mind is kind of worn, not just on your sleeve, but your entire way, your walk, your aura, right? And people, whether they know it or not, you know, can pick up other people's intelligence, you know? Um, I've had white people say very weird things to me, you know? Sometimes very dehumanizing, others not as much. Some might have positive connotations, but I can tell sometimes that even they don't know what they're saying. It's like popping out of their brain without being fully rosterized, you know? It's, like, it's something primal about it, that they feel they have to tell me things, period. The fact that throughout my life, people feel the need to tell me things. Even when I was a child, they didn't feel the need to stare at me and tell me things. It's like, it's like, I don't know if it's something I bring out of them or my energy. By the way, none of this means I'm a special person. I just, I think anybody could feel this way. You know, it's a strange thing. I guess I should put it part of psychodetonic discharge theory. It's an odd feeling. I think it's almost like an interdimensional feeling, really. You know, sure, it's borderline paranoia, but it's like, what if feeling alive and getting enough air and your mind working properly gave you like feelings of shock and dissociation from the people around you that other people could pick up or reinforce because in a way people were always in shock and they were meant to not be able to control themselves when someone looks like they're coming out of shock because it was so universal when it didn't exist it could actually be shocking to other people that you're not in as much shock as they are you know and a level in the brain that we can't control. The level that looks at someone's gender. The level that just, I think we all kind of smell energy. We've all got instincts, you know? People may not like the whiff of you, <laughs> you know? I...
like those two people that I said hi to today, the reason I kind of was able to know that they may be happy is that the guy who was walking down, and he started walking in the road, and I could tell that he was smiling, their energy was open, and there was kind of like an extra energy around them. It was like they were happy, but sometimes you can't tell, maybe they're malicious or drunk. You know, like there's different things that could be, but they're putting off a lot of energy, a lot of... I don't have good eyes, but I can see people's faces like you see the moon, like they give off a sort of energy, right? White faces, you know, they do, they're very expressive. And, uh, and they're very white. So it's like, if you see a lot of white, it means they're showing their face a lot, you know, and I think I'm seeing them baring their teeth, which for white people is supposed to be a good thing, which is a little strange, I think. So, you know, I've actually gotten rid of one of my teeth, so I'm a little less aggressive when I show my teeth. So it's not a sign of not having enough dental care, it's a sign of softness and wisdom. <laughs> also, it makes it harder to chew my food. <laughs> which will keep me slim over the long haul. <laughs> I hate the dentist. I hate the dentist. I would only go if I was in, like, extreme pain. <laughs> I just... I have a good one, you know? I just... I actually... I, I kind of smelled bullshit the last time I went. And I just... I thought, okay, you know, I'll just... Uh, I went 10 years at a time on, I think not 10 years, seven, maybe 10 years without going to a dentist. And my teeth were relatively okay. I had them all changed to uh, ceramic or whatever. There it is. This seems to have been fine, so I'm not too concerned. As you can see, I don't like really doing anything. To, I don't like going to doctors anymore. I've reached an age where it's like, yeah, I've had enough. <laughs> it's like, Plus, I don't need to anymore. There's so many years I had to because I was being domestically abused and I had all kinds of, you know, a lot of men get digestive disorders. So I'm just sick of being sick. You just, at some point, you're just sick of it. I just think like, oh, just please. I just never want to go into a hospital ever again. It's all possible. You know, so, mm, you know, that's what abuse does to you. you just get, it's nothing against the medical system. I just, I'm just having enough. You know? I got some good advice from people about cleaning my own teeth. Just that took down my fears, the sense of anxiety that can be like, oh, I gotta go to the dentist and my teeth are gonna rot, you know? Like, yeah, I mean, drug addicts, their teeth do rot, you know? You know, but it's like, you know, you can prevent that. Um, but I mean, the fact that I get fears about my body and my health just shows that I care. <laughs> it's not like I have, like, one guy grew up and his mother never talk, told him, took him to a dentist and he's basically lost most of his teeth, right? Or they're all rotten and stuff. And it's like, that's weird. That's just weird. Like, did she tell you not to brush your teeth too? <laughs> I mean, like, holy fuck. You know, like, wow, that's neglect, right? So... Oh, God, oh, ye faithful. It kind of makes sense that you'd want to be faithful in the winter because you want to be faithful to the sun. You know, the sun's gone away. Father's gone away to another land, and he's left the coldest version of himself. <laughs> it's like, hey, this, I've left this giant cold sun here for you children <laughs> so, so that they don't replace me. <laughs> you know? It makes winter cold so that the summer doesn't get replaced. You know, you come back and I'm like, oh, Summer, we missed you. And Winter's like, what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> it's like, we love you too, but you're so cold. <laughs> yeah, I know. Isn't it great? <laughs> I loved every minute of it. <laughs> yeah. Here you go, Father Summer. Take the little bastards, warm their little cockles until they come back next year. <laughs> I'm just going to go to the Antarctic and try to find some seal meat. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea where that came from. <laughs> More people should anthropomorphize nature. It's like basically giving nature life. It's like anthropomorphizing Mother Nature. It's like, what a ridiculous thing to do. It's like, hey, Mother Nature, did you know you're alive? The white people figured it out. You have an intelligence of your own. <laughs> That's right. Yes, you have voices of your own also. And if we gave our children voices, spirits, reasoning as though it was something they were already born with, we wouldn't risk eliminating it from them and then tearing them from their mother's uterus. Like the whole point was to basically tax us to death. 
for the burden of being born in the first place. And the only organs left worth talking about were the ones that had to do with increasing our earning power. <laughs> Yay! And you can't do that for me, so you might as well be dead, 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 like my mother and me. I'm going to pray to God, so he will leave me be. <laughs> oh, wait. Did I just say that out loud? It's like I had a voice. It's like he had a voice. The Rain Griffin story. It's almost like he was saying something. <laughs> it's almost like he was saying something. Rain Griffin. It's almost like he had a brain of his own. That there was like intelligence that actually coursed in his veins. That he could open his lips and make sounds with the pneuma of his own spirit. And without whose incredible connection to the universe, no man would have ever been born at all. And he thought, that was interesting. Much reviled in his time, we in the future have now come to see him as a somewhat retarded, insipid, loquacious idiot who was yet smarter than everyone else on the earth. For a short period of time between 1989 and 1990, on December 31st, <laughs> when he saw Die Hard for the first time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll be here all week <laughs> until I grow weak enough that there's no place left but to rub myself into the lamp. Emert gives forth a, a woman wearing Arabian clothing and a, tur and a, and a, and a turban and uh, has nice boobs, <laughs> you know? which makes it worth rubbing her lamp. <laughs> You'll see. <laughs> she comes out at the end of it like smoke comes out of a teapot. <laughs> I made her. I made her with my dick, you see. I made her. I made her with my magic lamp. <laughs> right. She came out, turned into a woman, like uh, God puts Adam to sleep, because he's basically half dead already, and takes her out of death's counterfeit, <laughs> makes her out of money, and then breathes the life of all people into his tax systems in the name of her uterus, which you tear and create all the tears and rips and balls in heaven. And so he's just got to tax your ass. So you tear his ass, you tear her ass, you terrorize your own ass forever until the sweet release of death. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's fun with words, <laughs> you know? You got tired of me talking about Santa Claus? Well, I changed subjects. That's what I do. I'm here to accommodate you. <laughs> you know, I'm here for your needs, YouTube. How can I make you happy? How can I make myself less so that you feel more? Is that the way the universe has to work? Or can life all be nourished? Yet the doorway of every day could be like the doorway to a language of happiness itself. That was always preserving life over death. And that language, maybe for like many years, generations of the white man, has been working really hard just like we have. It's been working so hard that it just ran out of breath like a thousand years ago and we didn't notice. And it still lives around us because it had to pull away so it didn't die. You know, Because if the earth lived the way we did, the earth would be dead. God creates dead. He creates dead people. God really only tries to make dead people and this way he forgives his entire creation for being nothing but death. And he gives you the opportunity to get forgiveness for nothing but death in all of your labors by worshiping him and earning your place in the language of his society and the society of his language, which is a tax-based demand upon our breath using a tonality of the nature of the ring of death around everything we do so that all we do it around is like the resounding ring of death instead of the ring of life. And the universe was kind of organized like an architecture in the language and a language in the architecture of how we see ourselves in the universe. <clears throat> but the doorway of every day, which is like the language of life and light, 
becomes besmirched. The language of our happiness lives, but it's like it doesn't work for us anymore. If every self-help book and every religious book in the world and everything that every psychiatrist and guru has ever done is about happiness, how come it's so limited? How come no one talks about it like it has anything to do with the nature of life itself? Because we don't have a language that treats it that way. And it deprives the brain of oxygen that it would need to think about that even being a possibility because we've been so good at eliminating it to make up for the oxygen that's eliminated from our world. The existence of which, like the spirit of reason when we were born, has been malfactored out of everything we ever think we were born to do and suffer in life. Like we're born with reason. We're born with a voice. A child doesn't have to be put on Santa's lap. They can scream and you can hear them and take them away. Why do you leave them there? Why do you not trust their their minds? Why does Santa just go, ho, 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 little one? Sometimes there's screamers. That's okay. I can replace my eardrums tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> ah, ah. But if any woman in the world screamed the way these little girls did, you would call the police. You would think somebody was raping her. And so you, you, you put it into a different set of proportions. You create a special place for Santa to rape your children. Because you've already eliminated their voice from any consideration, especially when you come near a Saturnalian god or agent of the state. Suddenly, the, the dimension, your child's in a different dimension, sitting on the lap in a dimension where suddenly it's okay for her to feel this way. And it's actually her fault, just like Adam and Eve, right? Oh, sorry, did I cry when you put me near that strange man's dick? Oh, my bad. How can I ever make up for it? Every time my mom would be abused sexually by my dad in public, her brothers and sisters and relatives would wonder why he didn't treat her, him better. They would see it exactly the opposite. Psychopathy is like opposite world. It's amazing how compatible white people are with abuse. They see it the opposite of what's happening, right? I had a woman come up to me outside of Qigong school and get in my face and basically spit venom into it, like right in front of me, like right here. And there's two white males who basically completely mirrored her behavior, mirrored her attitude, like I deserved it. They didn't need any explanation. Their brains just mirrored it. I see that, I saw that on two or three occasions in the two, inside the school and outside the school, where someone would do something humiliating to me, and I could sense that their, the, the galvanic nature of their bodies was electronically mirroring the change in energy in the entire atmosphere, here. Like it never happened because everyone just became part of the mind that made it necessary for it to happen. Right? And then they just kept going. You could see it in their musculature. It's like the person, by speaking humiliation to me, had set off like a chain reaction in everyone's body that led them to go into states that could accommodate it as though it didn't exist. In doing so, they became part of the entire organ of humiliation, just like we become part of society, organs of God's humiliation. Imagine, come to, come to Oregon, where you can experience the full Oregon of God's humiliation. Meet the mayor, Joe Bob, whom God is very proud of. Tell us, Joe, why is God so proud of you? Well, I managed to triple the taxes of anyone who could afford to live here. So, the schools are full with a lot of little muskrats of parents who have to rent garages so they have some place to go at the end of their loveless, meaningless lives. <laughs> Things they can't afford to feed the little schlep, so I started using leftover slop from the local pig farm. Seems the little ones took to it. Gave myself a badge of honor. <laughs> I love those little nippers.
a lot of white people, their children get upset and they basically tell them to shut up, get over it. They do that a lot. They don't realize they're doing it. They did a study of white women in England and um, they paid them. Uh, I don't say paid them, they told them that they'd be um, recorded audio and video and they found, I don't know how many hundreds of them that were in the study, and um, they found on average these white women would beat physically or sexually molest their children at least 50 times a month in what the clinicians took to be violent behavior uh, affecting brain development and that they didn't really think anything was wrong. The way they would talk to them, the way they would treat them, the way they would neglect them. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, the white world's a very fishy world, very wishy-washy on certain morals, especially around children. They, uh, they cart them around. No sooner are they born, you got them in the mall. And they take them around. That could be a big trip for a white person, taking their children to the mall, you know? Think of the intellectual stimulation of the mall. The elementary school took us to the zoo. Wow, and the game farm. Yeah, we could see other imprisoned animals. I just wanted to go back to school and finish the work. Let's get the work done. Let's get that grade 12 done and just fuck off. But give me some more papers to look at, more multiplication tables, more questions, more little maps I gotta color in. How many maps do you color in in history or geography and just, you know, shh, nations and stuff? You make their flags, you draw them out, you color them in. Woo wee! I've really done something. That really, you know, one summer my brother and I made up a game using a map and see how many countries in the world we could say in South America or Africa. And you take, you have a while to memorize them and see you can say the same. I don't remember most of them, but I, that was more useful than all of my schooling. I'll always remember where Peru and Brazil or, you know, you feel you kind of orient yourself a little bit, you know, to the world. And my public school did not do that. You've lost all your leaves. It's like, she's like, you finally noticed. Oh, there's some hanging here and there, but they've already fallen. It's kind of cool. They're all on the ground. You know what's cool? I just realized the tide comes in more than once. <laughs> that tomorrow morning when I go out there, I'll know the tide's going out so I can go in early, sit on my stone and have the water around me in the last crescent of the moon. And this has been a pretty important moon to me. And uh, 
the Lady of the Moon. And uh, because it's, it's been really the closure since I started working with the moon back in February. So it's like October closure you know, from the February moon. You know, nine months, nine moons. We got to the ninth moon, and this is like the end of the ninth moon, this new moon coming up. So I think it's going to be pretty special. With, and with this tide, the way it is, I'll be able to, uh, in the morning, between four and five, be able to sit there, and the water will be all around me, but it'll also be going away because I learned something today. It's like it's going out, so I'll be surrounded by water on a little island of stone in total blackness with geese and stuff around me, and shh, tomorrow will be a little quieter. And that'll be kind of fun. Loved. If I were Latino, even little vino, vino, I had too much. I want to be a Latino. I drank some vino. Now I want Ribino. I like moss faces. Hey, moss faces. Yeah, there's another moss face. There's, nature just looks at you sometimes. I think you need help. It's like lots of intelligence there. I've seen things in nature sometimes. If I was a painter, I guess I would paint them. Beautiful things. The heart is a really bright heart on this one. Hmm. Nature repays attention. Yeah. <laughs> We're all pretty happy. Tree. It looks like a pretty nice place to be. Ah, let's take this one. I'm trying to think what to eat. I was like, I think I'll have a piece of toast. I'm always chiding myself for not eating my toast. Well, let's eat the toast. Eat the toast. Eat the toast. It's not like I'm on a survivor show. I'm not without food. I mean, that's really torturous, man. man. That's like torture. Like, why would you go in nature and not bring some food with you? Like, Jesus Christ. That's just torture. Why are these people torturing themselves? Because like good white people, they enjoy the idea of learning how to live without. But you don't want to watch people cutting coupons, no. You want to watch them catching a trout and drowning their sorrows in the rain. I like that. Drowning sorrows in the rain. I think white people jack each other up. It's not just the egos being big. It's like when they're around each other, they jack each other up. They like getting jacked up. It's an up-tempo energy without really the heart to back it up. So it's very aggressive. It's fine if like you're up-tempo and you have a big heart, you know? Like a big bear of a man. The kind of person who could be talking and have a, a lively discussion, and you could go to sleep. And they wouldn't mind. You would just feel comfortable being around them. And you wake up and they go, hey, who there, Ian? <laughs> you missed all my best stories. <laughs> Might have to ask you to stay after class. <laughs> or just put your finger up my ass and we'll call it eat. <laughs>
take your finger out of my ass. I'm leaving you behind. <laughs> Robin Williams. <laughs> that guy was good. I like that guy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, like the abject survival. You know, bring food, bring some coffee, bring some weed. I, I mean, people would probably pay to see me stay outside for a week or two and some nice accommodations. I don't know what I would do with a tarp. These people get a tarp. I'm thinking to myself, oh yeah, you know, tarp, you know, you think that saves the day, tarp, right? Tarp, yeah, tarp, of course, tarp, yeah. Bring the tarp, everyone. <laughs> a tarp covers a host of sins, <laughs> you know? They use tarps like for dead bodies, all in, you know, dirt, ash, garbage sometimes, you know? The old tarps. It's like the, the duct tape of, uh, of carrying and protective material. <laughs> Put your stuff in a tarp. Cover your stuff with a tarp. Tarp this, tarp that. I don't know if, if I'd know exactly what to do with a tarp. If I was on a show and it was the first night and I had to set up my tarp, I'd go to like the few places that I know. It's like, come on, everyone. This is the special tree where I like to sit and talk to myself in the rain. <laughs> and the whole show, like six days later, somehow on the live, like, hey, and this is the place I go to talk to myself in the rain. And you're like, what? Dude, what does this dude spend his life doing? And then they do a little bio, a little biopic. It's like, hi. And like, they all have people, like families, they kiss before they go. And it's just like me actually in nature every day. It's like, yeah, this is where I start most of my days. <laughs> the other competitors are like, fuck, this dude spends every day in the woods. This is just another day. <laughs> it's like, oh, wait, he doesn't know how to use a tarp. It's okay. <laughs> I don't know what to do with my tarp. I think, I don't think I'm going to use it, you know? I'm going to let Mother Nature just shower me with her loving ways. <laughs> Three hours later in the pouring rain. Hey, I love that these cameras are waterproof. Too bad God didn't make me that way. <laughs> wow, it's cold. Jeez. <laughs> hey, if I jizz myself right now, nobody would know. <laughs> oh, that was so funny. <laughs> Oh, wait, the sun's coming out. Where'd I put the weed? Somehow that managed to stay dry. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> I guess we all have our priorities, everyone. And that's just one to grow on. <laughs> Remember this, children. If you don't know the moral of the story, it means you're the moron of the story. <laughs> there's either a moral or there's a moron. Which one are you going to be? <laughs> which one are you going to see? And then, based on that, which one are you going to be? <laughs> right when you hear that Jesus raises people from the dead <laughs> well uh, there's either a moral or a moron to that story have you ever seen anyone come back to life from the dead state in fact you know the weird thing is is that when things die in a way they're still alive you know So what Jesus is really saying in the words is like commending, not only killing someone because he's the Lord of death, but commending something that in some sense has a life to it, the spirit of the thing, and basically eliminates all of that. Right? A real master would say, let us honor the spirit of this creature. Though they are dead, life itself has never abided it is not doesn't have death. Life doesn't have death. Things can die, but the language of life never has a death to it. And it's like, huh? and the Western mind is like, what are you talking about, man? I never used that part of my brain. Yeah, that's the sound of air getting into certain parts of your brain. It's like, it's like life and joy coming to the inside of that tomb that Indiana Jones goes to in the Raiders of the Lost Ark. And he doesn't have to leave a bag of gold so he can get his fucking skull back or the skull of his fucking father or whatever, you know? What, what, what is really a jewel worth risking your life to find? What about the crystal skull of your father that you can't buy with any amount of money? What about the beautiful crystal skull of the entire universe refracting about the endless rainbows of everlasting life? What about the life in death that is born when we are? and not the death in life. What about the language of life? The language of birth? The language of our hearts? 
of the words that make us happy, heal our wounds. And in a very wonderful way, because nothing else, however wonderful, could ever do so. Healing always comes down to our own life, our own words, our own thoughts, our own feelings, our own fears. And the universe of happiness and sadness that we may or may not want to try building out of them and say, the world is such and such a good place, or the world is a bad place, or my world is a good place, or a bad place. This is how confident I am in my world. This is what I'm vulnerable to. This is where I take this vulnerable body and put it all day long to gain confidence. The confidence to build a world or a language out of my own language, out of my own life, that the world can approve of and say, yes, this is a good man. He has created something wonderful. You can't see it, but it's wonderful. He's learned to co-create the health of his mind, that of the universe around him. And that is an astounding feat in any way, in any language. It's a simple thing. The great thing about it is that you have to keep a lot of trouble out of your life in order to do it. So that solves most of the trouble in you right away. You give yourself something to do that can't abide a certain amount of trouble because it prevents you from accomplishing what you want to do every day. At the same time, I've found enough troubles living this way that it could seem like that being able to heal in nature, the better I get at it, the more troubles came my way. It's like, you know, a little counterintuitive. Sometimes I think that's how you know you're doing it right. The vortex of the world doesn't want you to be happy. It wants you to question your judgment, make you think you're going the wrong way and you're going the right way. Today, I thought the tide was coming in, and I was going the wrong way. And it's only then, when I abandoned my quest, that the geese were roused and flew away. <laughs> it was just it was dark. I didn't want to risk suddenly just the tide coming. I don't know why, how long I thought I could stand there. It's not the kind of thing I like to experiment with, with the ocean coming in in the morning, <laughs> in the dark. Tomorrow, I think we'll be a little more bold. I don't like to set a precedent. I don't like to take risks. Stupid. <coughs> yeah. I say that then when I, when I do take risks or I do become cavalier, maybe nature will be merciful. I think I said earlier that you would think that I would get up and go get a job, but I think the fact that I'm aware that I'm taking a risk and you take it like, you know, not a, not a huge dramatic like I'm going to die risk, but in a way, like, Working is a risk, not working is a risk. Life is a risk. I take a risk. I take some risk living this way. But that in a way lets you know you're doing something. When life is going to be a risk, you try to make them the ones you want to take. It's like the world is meant to be scary. It makes people want to hold on to their jobs. People want something to be afraid of because it reinforces why they chose to live the way they do. You don't see, all, you're driving down the road, you see a bunch of homeless people going, hey, hey, we're wet and hungry and we hate the government. And you're like, you go to your job, you know, it's like, yeah. you drink your coffee, you're like, life is good, you know? <laughs> Other people's suffering reinforce the luxuries that we have to not have to suffer the way they do. It's like in Speed when the character played by Keanu Reeves, it's basically Keanu Reeves. Speed is basically Keanu Reeves. Ke I think people think Keanu Reeves was on that bus and Keanu Reeves saved everyone. Because <laughs> I know I do. And this person falls out and this one person is smart. I don't know what gives him the qualifications to say this, but he's like, like every man thinks like in a crisis, I would become Keanu Reeves and I would make sure the bus stayed on course. Which of course I'm sure we would all do. And uh, <laughs> He says, you know, it's okay to feel good that you weren't dragged under the bus. It's kind of awful though, isn't it? You don't have to feel guilty that you're alive and they're dead. 
And if this was a Sunday school class and you were listening to this as I say it, for instance, you might say, what the hell are you talking about, Willis? What do you mean, feeling good because someone's dead? I wouldn't even have thought about that except you said it. If you watched that film and that line was never there and you saw their body language and it was on mute, would you understand what was happening? It's kind of an interesting experiment, isn't it? And then reinforced by the line, hey, it's okay that you're not dead. You know, hey, it's okay that you're not dead. It's okay to be happy to be alive. Now, let me finish my work. <laughs> he's so nice, isn't he, in a crisis? Even when he's pumped up, he's like, hey, hold on, Trinity. When we're done, I really want to share with you how important I find a woman's mammary glands as it offers nothing but the possibility of the ample nourishment of their young. Now back to our movie. <laughs> I've mentioned that actress's breasts like 10 times. I just think they're amazing. She was in a film called The Red Planet with, with and it, the best part of the film is when uh, Val Kilmer sees her and she's in the shower and it's like, I guess they're part of a team so they don't care. It's like a co-ed dorm, right? And she's like, hey, can you pass me that towel? As she's dripping off and I'm like, man, a towel, a brush, a car, anything you want <laughs> at that point. <laughs> it's silly, isn't it? It's absolutely silly. It's like what you don't know about a woman, you automatically say, it's amazing, it's amazing, it's amazing. How beguiling it must be for females. She was just like, they just have to be pretty. And it's like, they see me like the most amazing source of pleasure and love that they'll never have. I have all the power in this situation. It's awful, isn't it? Like as in youth, like that we grow up and then our libidos are based on desperation or different forms of aggression or passive aggression that men and women need to learn to deal with the, the, the electronic force of the convulsions of how we adjust to the force being used against us to keep us against our will from our homes and really even the nature of our own minds. But telling us that this is what you need to make your mind smart and ready to be the good little boy and girl that you've always wanted to be, don't you? Don't you? Yes. All right. Okay. Okay. And then you've done and you realize you never took a shit once while you were at school. You're like, huh, <laughs> isn't that like kind of sexual abuse? <sighs> but then you look at Trinity's boobs and you're like, everything's nice again. It's worth going to Mars just to see that. <laughs> I would sign up. And they're like, is she going to be there? <laughs> <laughs> and she sees my toothless grin and it's like she just takes a deep breath <sighs> release <laughs> release I was sitting all alone mm. And then I sensed there was another right beside me. Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> if I got breasts, they would take them away from me. They'd be like, you're not allowed to have them. <laughs> it was such a sweet November. A do, do, do. <laughs> Look, it's Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> they need each other. <laughs> I wonder what, like, the main trade between Sodom and Gomorrah was <laughs> Must have been very different cultures. Yet they're both equally bad. Sa Dama Sadama Sadamago Major Sadam Major Sodom Major So Sodom Major Mora, Sodom, Major Mora, Sodom, Major Mora, Major Death. Sodom, Major Mora, MAGA. Look at that, make America great again. Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Make 
America, Sodom and Gomorrah. You know? Isn't that interesting? Sodom, Maja, Magamora, Sodom, Megamora, Megadeth. I'm a giant asshole. Seeing Megadeth and then a giant asshole behind them and then the whole thing's like the Sodom and Gomorrah tour and then everyone in the audience is like listening to them and at some point it's like there's a sudden epiphany that comes over hundreds of thousands of fans watching all over the world and like oh my god and then suddenly they shoot to the election you know and there's a debate between Donald Trump or anal Trump and anal the other side Kamala Harris Harris harass I wonder if she has any Harass, har, harassment charges. And you're like, whoa, how does this make all sense? The eyes that see, and the eyes that be, and the eyes that sing with death with me, and ring on ring, and sea on sea, we gather up the joy of me. Ha ha ha. What did I just click on? A very common thought that are probably erupts out there is, what did I just click on? To which I respond, it is not about the click. It is not the button. It is not the video. It is not the question in your mind. It is rather the mind before the mind was born, ringing and singing to its mother. And that song moves like the wind upon the lips of day and listen and you shall hear the first lay that rang through the universe and the mind before the mind when you were born and the mind after that mind that always came from the mind before the mind and the ring and the sound that can sing like the wind before you were born and to the man and to the wool man which is a great woe to man. And so I stay away from the woe man. I like the women. I seek the women. I stay away from the women, but I seek the women. You know, women, is there any women? Can I have the women's bathroom, please? The woman's bathroom? Like, no, the women, the women's bathroom. You have bathroom for everyone. Women's bathroom. And while you're at it, I want a Klingon vessel, a Klingon Wessel, sorry, my mistake. <laughs> Klingon Wessel. You have a Klingon Wessel with women. A Klingon Wessel with women. That doesn't make any sense. A Klingon Wessel with women. A Wessel with women. Wessel with women. Women with a vessel. Women Wessel. Wessel women. I like women wrestling. <laughs> women wrestling, yes. Women wrestling. Women wrestling. Mm, 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 mm. Women wrestling, women wrestling, and we do this, and we do this, and we do this. We take aim. Cupid says, hey, you're taking my job away. The union says you must die. Cement is poured on your head, and we build a condo for old white people. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good bet. They will only last so long, and then we get money back on the turnover. <laughs> we, it's... Uh, we do the deal, we're dead. It's almost like my life were fled before I learned to speak. What joy returns, what blood is nigh, what leaves have spread over this sighing man whose wet leaves cannot Lay yet to rest his God, whate'er he learned or had to in the, in the blood of the blood of his kind, who returns to the forest and sings to himself, but also joins a chorus of other realms and brings with him what day may come. Who see the sun? No, not me, perhaps. He came before me and is not worthy to wash my feet. <laughs>
<laughs> I would love anybody who washed my feet. That's not right. Anyone who washed my feet would be a most acceptable person. <laughs> Nobody's ever done that before. I think you have to pay for that kind of thing. <laughs> but that's okay. I've got leaves in my pocket, if that's all right, to pay for your excellent foot cleaning. <laughs> Let the dog out. Oh, I'm glad for that song, you know. It's the only song I can really sing. If I did karaoke, it'd be like, oh, let the dog out. Roo, 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 roo. <laughs> Do that for Simon Cow. Oh, let the dogs out. Roo, 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 roo. You get the golden star, the golden hammer. <laughs> you get right to the end, a million dollars. Thank you very much. Have a nice life. <laughs> You're like, whoa, the quickest winner of the X Factor. <laughs> How does it feel? It was a whirlwind experience, really. Sing it for us. Sing us again. It's amazing. Woo! Woo! Oh my God! Taylor Swift is like, listen to this, Miss Swift. Woo! Woo! Oh my God! He is an angel. <laughs> he sings like an angel. Oh my God! I'm giving concerts to millions of people. I start elaborating on a thing. <laughs> And then I go back to the <laughs> Rolling Stone magazine calls it another genre of music, the likes of which Mozart himself would be ashamed to have not discovered in his own time. <laughs> Who knew that barking like a wounded animal would capture the world's imagination like even Jesus Christ was unable to do? <laughs> or is a magazine written by someone in his own mind? to do himself credit where others would find naught but another level of his shame to which he had yet managed not to sink. I think there's always a lower place the mind can go. That's cool. Imagine if you were a singer and you could always go lower. You're like, do 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 Oh, oh, hey, 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 hey. I gotta come up for a while like a baby seal. Who goes there? I think I just woke up the bear in my mind. I was like, who? Yes, sound such fathoms the man has not rang out since before Jesus walked around in a loincloth, pissing other people's pants with his father's venomous tripe. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and still that sponge man came along and started to help the white man to soak it back up again. <laughs> Who knew that a character who looks like cheese, who's very absorbent and wears pants, could possibly help with what Jesus left undone? It's like the first Gulf War. A second bush needs to be torched on fire with a crucifix of another Jesus who's fire retardant and becomes fire and walks around with fire all the time. And he speaks and it sounds like, and people are like, fuck. <laughs> we want to do everything he says, but we don't know what it means. And then another dude comes along outside of his ass, like the little woman in the shoe, and goes, do, 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 do. my master say, you must be careful not to create forest fires. <laughs> Even though he likes burning very much, he likes to be the one in charge. He does like, <laughs> you see Jesus, all forest fires, as they reach people's houses, they have phones, and it's like the face of Jesus comes out. Oh, que va, consume me in my demonic nature. <laughs>
churches are like, they start closing them up. Oh, God, it was all for nothing. Jesus was the devil. Oh, God. Oh, Rain Griffin was right. I don't know how many years I went on this earth before I heard um, Christopher Hitchens talk about how Jesus was not a good person. And then if he was a real person, he'd be like one of the most evil people who ever lived. That he said some of the most evil things about wanting to destroy, for instance, in Matthew, the human family. Right? And you look at white people, and it's like if Jesus was the CEO of the corporation of God's world, um, he'd be getting the big fat bonuses when you think about white people like the creation of white people that's his greatest invention the the broken home that isn't the broken home who lived who worships a god that's not really a god and testify to a currency of love that isn't really love and isn't really a currency and a life and a truth that isn't really to do with life and isn't really the truth but it's the standard for any truth that can live above the war of the background radiation, of the pandemonium, of life paying the whore of Babylon for the right to sip a cup of nut, but the obscenities which God has pissed into the human bloodstream and forced us to pay for if we know it's good for us. And for whatever life we've ever borrowed from a sea of death that we deserve not more than. For the impertinence of feeling anything that can't be converted into death's and God's language as it happens. For such as some may pray, they borrow not this ravage which Rome hath wrought. This soul that can be bought. Bought. If you think about bought, ba, the soul, bought, you bought things. The soul is a unit of currency in an electronic world lifted off of the earth. The English language doesn't actually ground into the earth. It's not a natural language. At the same time, it's kind of like circling a giant drain. But instead of grounding, which time itself is grounded in a kind of black hole system, but, you know, right? Time is not getting sucked into a drain, though. It's actually recycled. Time is part of the flow of the mind of the entire Earth in relation to the North Star. So even if it's flowing out of you, like you would think, like, if you, if you could feel time, it'd be like your life or your mind was flowing out of you, or out of your head or out of your feet, right? But it's, it's actually the current, you know, that the merest resistance of helps build up a body inside our mother's womb. that um, in heaven, or heaven, is like being on the other side of the, of the flow of this current. But you're not dead. And your energy body is the natural inhabitant of that place. And the closest thing to what your mind feels like when you leave your body is basically just like having eyes without having eyes. Just you feel exactly the same, and you don't need to have smell because your thought and your mind have and we're always the pattern for your entire body anyway. And so much as there's everything for you can sense and feel and get with a body and a mind in a physical dimension is um, the fruit of uh, the relationship of the spirit itself to the, the substance of its own eternal abode. You could see it as a loss, or you could see it as a great fortune, or you could see it as a boon. You know, it's either life is a bust, and this is the limit of your mind as long as you're here, and why, why have all these things if it's enough just to float bodilessly in some eternal realm of existence? But that's the thing, you're not bodiless, because your whole sense of your body is made of the substance of your mind in its relationship to its natural abode. Which is why when you feel most natural on the earth, you feel like you're in heaven. The idea is to get the body and the senses of the mind to enjoy their natural place, given that the mind is the basis for everything. Right? Why wouldn't you be meant to be comfortable?
you could ask the question, why does the mind exist instead of not existing? But the thing is, we can only ask that question in the Western world because we invented the non-existence of the mind. We found a language that demands a level of our pneuma that actually stops the full articulation of our pneuma into our mind and body and blood as a kind of tribute or sacrifice, which in a sense, in a technical sense, like the, if you have to do that, you can, and that's your currency, you shouldn't expect to ever be able to pay enough. And certainly it opens up a level of debt in the space and the universe that we could never fill. So it basically creates the vacuum of space out of what used to be the proper organs of our mind, which include a language and culture of how we think about a world that relates the same value as the nature of our mind. It's habitation in our body, but our body as our mind, the spirit of our mind. Um, that even if my body lay here dead, my spirit and that of the language of my body, even if it was consumed in the earth, is still alive. And it's alive with the same thing, life with which I was born. And there's been no surcease to the mechanisms either of my birth or my continued existence in and out of birth on the earth. So really nothing has died. But the, the consideration of non-existence, the consideration of the multiplication of our sort of existential pain, right? That even if you're not in pain as a white person and you're rich, you can be utterly compulsive every day of your life as though your brain is constantly in pain, but there's no way of knowing why because it had become ahistorical in order to make money. So it just can't stop. Right. And any, per any person who's successful works really hard. I look at my sister, but it's like I tried to create a thought experiment for her the first time I saw her in our entire life, really, in a conversation about where her mind might be happy, not working so hard, but still having enough stimulation so that it could like even enjoy a higher level of operation if she spent more time in nature. Because if you have a good mind, like my sister, you can do that because you always have something to do with your mind. It's not like Sherlock Holmes where I have to take cocaine I need enough to do. I'll always have enough to do because I have emotions, right? I have needs and certainly um, neglect. So, but society is made out of so many costs. It's such a sin-based universe that when you experience excessive torture or your family as a structure experiences overwork, over sacrifice. Um, you know, we can only do so much. The body, the mind, taken up with the, you know, the, the kind of cult-like quality of what everyone's doing and the wars and the challenges of the age. The body, the frame, the mother, the father, the boy, the girl can express as an individual within a group, right, uh, a great need to be released from an excessive amount of, of fatigue that has become a job in itself. And in a world based on sin and the way on waste products, that person just becomes a waste. Like they can't pay for themselves anymore. And it's really quite sadistic if you think about it. Even though not everyone in the family of man experiences that, that's an insult to the family of man and all of our labors. So instead of someone like me being an insult to all the work other people do, it is rather all of our work or yours that is insulted. If we can't accommodate the labors of those who suffer disproportionately in the name of their families, which is certainly a possibility when you consider, yes, how much we give to the world and what a wonderful gift it was and what a wonderful thing the banks have made out of everything we've given. And I want to grind up more of my fucking flesh and blood so I can make more of this shit. You know, that's what I want to fucking do. I'm sorry. I almost made it there. I almost made it without getting passive aggressive. I'm sorry. But anyway, you get the idea. It's like a meat grinder. The world history, the 20th century is like a fucking meat grinder. We should at least have a pack of sausages filled with Germans, Jews, and maybe Winston Churchill <laughs> and Jesus, you know, mm, fry that up. You know, it's not kosher, but somehow acceptable. I mean, we were all used as sausage. I mean, seriously, nobody, it's fucking sausage making. History should be like, hey, welcome. I'm going to learn 20th century. Hey, sausage making. And next, the 21st century, um, unpacking the sausage. <laughs> you know, separating the peppers from the garlic from the, you know, just the flesh of innocent human beings. <laughs> just 
seeing if we can use it like God as a kind of clay to make a new Adam and Eve and celebrate it with like the day of new dawning where we relive the Genesis in the Bible in real time and see what happens. See if we had a different outcome, you know? See if our civilization at the roots of the most powerful religion in the history of the earth can take us anywhere but death, sin, and pornography. <laughs> you know, it's like, let's do it. <laughs> you know, you've got to give you the brain of the future a chance. Do you, do you see a future in the Garden of Eden? In the Garden of Eden, Christians give up ever having a future. So how could they distinguish from one kind of suffering or torture or another? Anywhere, you know? And then you get the Frankfurt School turning these people into psychiatrists? And who are they going to see but the people who are children who suffer the most from the unwanted scourges of the industrial warfare of the 20th century? Hey, you know, hey, we'll just slap a sticker on them and shove some pills up their ass and see if they, you know, see what they get up to. It's like, hey, you know, yeah, next one, please. Next one. Next one. Psh, psh, slap them around, undermine their sense of self, psh, give them a prescription and whoop. <laughs> I just love it. Love it. It's also very loving, isn't it? You know? Don't worry, honey. Well, we know you've been crying a lot lately. We're going to go to the psychiatrist. Good things happen there. Always. It's the best. They're going to scientists and doctors will stick tubes into you and figure out what's wrong. <laughs> nothing's wrong. Oh, nothing's wrong with me. It's you. It's the world. I don't know. It's so confusing. <laughs> it's okay, honey. <laughs> It'll all be okay. Why do you say that? It's not okay. Look at me. Do I look okay? You're saying the opposite of what I am. You're saying the opposite, you two-faced bastard cunt. <laughs> You're saying the opposite of the truth. You're lying. I know I'm upset. I know I look like shit. You can't get the car keys fast enough to take me back to my child fucking therapist. And you think everything's going to be okay? It's not going to be okay. Look at yourselves. Take a fucking video of this fucking moment. You're insane. You're fucking insane. Look at your fucking child. It's not fucking okay. Shut the fuck up. Put your car keys down and fucking get your brain working. Take a few days off work. Stop drinking like a fucking fish and look at your fucking children. White people need to learn you can't pay people to be your children's mommy and daddy. You know, they're not going to go away. School teachers are just surrogate parents and it's ridiculous. You can't pay people to raise your children. It was a fantasy. It didn't work. Or it worked all too well. You know, you can't see where it doesn't work. You don't hear from those people. <laughs> The world is not meant to teach us the language of happiness, right? The pursuit of it, but never the language. How can you pursue happiness in a language, in a world that demands nothing but the subversion of the very nature and son and universe and heritage and mother of our happiness and father? Like the whole fucking world, right? We're living like our towns in the ugliest possible version of the world. Today, as white people, we're living the ugliest possible version of the earth. And if you like it, great. You've got a lot to look forward to. It's the ugliest possible way of living. It's the most subversive. It's the most unconscious. It's the most you could live and the most like shit and make it look good. It's the most evil it can be and still look good. It's the most good it could look and still be completely fucking evil. We got the most overfed, overeducated, undernourished, under mentally developed race in the history of the world. And, and your leaders know it. Of course they do. Our history knows it. Our literature knows it. TV writers know it. Everyone knows it. You know it. I know it. The white race has problems. We're like in the exhaust tailpipe of a Hellcat in Fast and Furious 666. 
This time Vin Diesel really bends over and lets one rip. Get ripped. Rip refers to the tearing of muscle, which encourages it to grow bigger and stronger. Basically, it's torture for the body. It's amazing how many different white things and exercises and spiritual practices are actually a vague and veiled way of torturing oneself into being beautiful. Because you know you're beautiful, and I know that you're beautiful, and everyone is so beautiful, and I am so beautiful, and you are so beautiful, and this tree is so beautiful, and the sky is so beautiful, and we are so beautiful, our mother is so beautiful, father is so beautiful. Our home is just so beautiful, and our life is just so beautiful, and we just want so beautiful, a language to be beautiful, and we just gotta be beautiful, and everyone's gotta be beautiful, because if everyone can't be beautiful, oh, if you tell me everyone can't be beautiful, if everyone can't be beautiful, I don't want to be beautiful. If everyone cannot be beautiful, I don't want to be beautiful. I don't want to be beautiful. If everyone can't be beautiful, if everything can't be beautiful, and it's not, then I don't want to be beautiful. If everything can't be beautiful, and it's not, then I don't want to be beautiful. I don't want to be another plaster cast to freeze on the face of the world. I don't want to twist this ugly place to lie to the boy and the girl. I don't want to put an appearance or facade. Over what this world calls good and murder and God. I got the gift of words, so I use them. It's my occupation. Word user, sound maker. As my native name would be, eats a lot, crazy sound maker, who sometimes says stuff. <laughs> Puffs a lot of green dragon, noisy sound maker, who sometimes says stuff who clearly doesn't like vaginas anymore and wants that also in his part of his native name so people know. No more vaginas. I, I learned living in the small town that women become quite the uh, representatives of their reproductive organs. Um, creatures that learn in their brain how to master the kind of Sherman tank of their entire chassis, you know? including like like they're playing a video game and, and putting it in various positions so they can fire their female erections into the right person by the way they look into their eyes. <laughs> and so it's like like a war going on. It's like a battle in Germany while their eyes are smoldering or black or dark or pupillated or dilated. <laughs> so it's like, and it's like, ah, like they're forcing you to have a moment with them. It's like, shh, you know, they're... I've noticed a lot of like cougars will try to grab my gaze, you know, and it's like, fuck, I stopped wanting to look at people, you know. Sorry, I wrote a comment on YouTube today and it really, I wish I'd taken a copy of it now. It wasn't, wasn't the nicest comment, but it's like, I won't repeat it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, testing the boundaries, I guess. Mm. An unfortunate situation, really. You know, just a situation in life.
In a way, there is a, a touch of intelligence to it, saying, like, this woman is a trucker, and she says a lot of male truckers stare at her or take pictures of her or her colleagues. It's not very nice, but I'm, I'm guessing, like, a lot of them are lonely. You know? And even as the video's going, she gets a CB call from another trucker giving her what I think is probably unsolicited advice about how he saw her truck and something's coming off of it and she might want to retie it because it's going to come off before she gets to her destination. And like, when you play this out, you know, and it's like, wow, you know, unsolicited advice, you know, even as she's making a video about a truck beside her that's stalking her, you know, you see how white people stalk. You know, so <sighs> yeah, lonely men and stalking, and it's like that's really undermines you, you know, like passive aggressive criticism, you know, like hey, you might want to get your tires pumped, you know. I've like white people like to start conversations with me by giving me unsolicited suggestions, or finishing taking my time by giving me unwished for suggestions as to my productivity in life. You know, and I think I'm being nice. Oh, no. Oh, there it is. Good. <laughs> I think I'm being nice in how I'm treating. Like, I'm, my heart is pretty good today, right? I'm not being too mean. Like, I'm not being overly angry. It's just like, yeah, it gets on me too. And a woman puts up a video saying what bothers her. Then it's like, hey, I can relate to that. Somewhat. Boy, the seat is really hard. Sorry. I should probably use this blanket a little more efficiently. Oh, my bony butt is really getting it, I'll tell you. Wow. I had this white girl that used to live in this house I shared with some hippies, and her butt was so bony. I would say, hey, why don't you take a bath? And she said, I tell you, I can't take a bath. My butt is too bony. It hurts. Her butt was so fucking bony because she wasn't getting enough food. She was living off of rice. and She was living like a starvation diet. Really skinny. And it's like, I should have said something. No, she was surviving. It's not pretty. I could see, like, the men in her life, too. Like, she just learned to tell a story. Like, a lot of white people I find I've been around are kind of deadbeats. Really, lying, stealing, thieving at different levels, you know. And uh, it, I feel like it's a waste of time knowing them quite often. And uh, I look at the men and even like that these nice girls tell you they're in their life. And they really make up stories that make them sound better than they are, you know. And then also I can relate to that because I've probably done that too. It's because, you know, even the greatest psychopath has a human side. You know, the world of psychopathy, which I say is the white world, I mean, all these people are humans and feelings. Like, I'm not saying they're not human. I'm saying that there is a, a prevalent uh, way that the Western society is electronically set up that serves biases inherent in, an, an, in a very electronically specific, brain-specific language and basically entire way of organizing time, which is the Western English way of life that favors... Emo emotionally repressed and so suspiciously undeveloped human development. So you get really undeveloped development. You know, the psychopathic brain can offer, off, operate in a world that goes between human, high human functioning and virtue to completely subhuman behavior in groups, en masse, over time that is all very necessary and enjoyable part of life but masks and lives around with some perfect intelligence that the language of various types of white people seems to lend itself to, um, living around and knowing enough and how to ignore and never hear about the cost to other human life. Mm. And I go to great lengths to explain this every day to myself and anyone else who cares to listen. Hi, little birdie. Sing, sing, little birdie. Sing, sing, little birdie. Mm. Sing, 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 sing. Oh, mm. sing, sing. I love you so. Sing, little birdie. Woo. 
I forget how a tiny little bird can remind me where I am. Hmm? Thank you. And with every sound that little birdie makes, takes a complete picture of the entire universe. So the story of the universe could be understood by waves of sound traveling through all the different signatures where sound can travel, which like ether, kind of travels through what you would call subspace. So sound itself was like a time traveling machine. And it, it was related to an energy with which, you know, a single sound from that bird can kind of understand or cast a story of the entire universe. As much as the entire universe is actually involved in the entire earth, like a complete language of creation. Right? That has never deprived us of the imagination, hunger, thirst, whimsy, humanity, imagination, and however tortured determination to 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 suck at the teeth of the, the visionary geometry of a single breath, much less a song, from the lips of man or beast in some natural place that might restore the mind to an order that no billion number of books or bits or anything else could ever restore you to in a strictly didactic fashion across time. And your mind is that quick. I was just thinking of that song, Jack be nimble, Jack be quick, Jack jump over a candlestick. But what if Jack jumps over a candlestick that has a candle, and the moment, if you shrink it down really quickly, that he gets right over, because I'm thinking Jack is pretty small, just jumping over, right? And his little balls are just going to get roasted. There'll be a little little singe. There'll be a smell in the air. Be like, oh, what's that? Oh, that's Jack's balls. <laughs> It's a little bit of Jack's pubic hair. Because <laughs> he can't be nimble or quick enough. You know, like, he can just barely get over it when there's no flame. And one day he's like, oh, shit. You know, Jack, be nimble. Jack, be quick. You know, as if like running really quickly will put the flame out between his legs. It's a very white little, you know. Shh. Be quick. Better hurry. I've seen that in other white people, the sense that of hurrying, having to hurry to do something. I think punctuality is very important, but I don't like having to hurry. I want both. I want to be punctual and not have to hurry. I'm the kind of guy that would go to the airport six, if I had to travel, which I don't, and I was like, you know, someone bought me a trip to like some exotic place. I'm sure I would show at the airport and the plane was at five o'clock in the evening. I'd get the earliest cab and get there. I'd be like Tom Hanks at that airport and I would spend the entire day familiarizing myself with all of the gates and the gate where I'm going to have to go and, and the board where I get to, you know, and I'd plan my day, you know, <laughs> to make sure I don't miss that flight. I think airports are pretty interesting, and since I don't go on them very much, it might be kind of cool. Yeah. Get a magazine, have a cup of coffee, pretend to read it while you look at people, and then suddenly be absolutely mesmerized by an ad for, you know, Chanel baby powder for men. And I'm like, wow, they're really serving every gender now. <laughs> I mean, I don't mind all the girly stuff in the magazines if they started directing it at me. Like, you know, put a little thing for men, you know? Which is helpful because in a way, all the models look like young boys anyway. So it's like, even not that I'm into that kind of thing, but at least it brings some kind of male aspect to it. Like, how do you make, if I was a marketing company, I would say to my employees, if I owned a market, I'd be like, I wanna do an ad for um, feminine napkins, meaning tampons and, what are those other things called? They have like two different names for them, right? 
tampons are the ones that plug the hole, and there's the other that's just kind of like a, a gentle panty liner. That's basically what it is. And uh, just to catch any residual, you know, effluent. <laughs> I mean, they don't like to talk about it, but, you know, there it is, you know. And, like, try to bring something man, male into it. It's like, you know. Keep yourself clean until he goes down between. <laughs> no, that's not. Be happy and healthy and find a man who's wealthy. <laughs> Be happy as a tampon, com a tampon commercial so that men feel better about themselves. <laughs> I want a girlfriend that looks like the women in those car commercials, you know, when you drive, guys driving, they look so happy. It's like, ah, it's so easy being a father in a car commercial. You ready to go for a drive? Sure, Dad. How about you, Mildred? Absolutely. <laughs> it's such, it just makes us so happy and good looking and all of our problems go away. It's like a chariot across the river sticks. <laughs> Maybe that's why we're in the sticks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, fiddlesticks, where is this commercial going? Let's go back on the road. You're right. We should listen to our GPS. <laughs> Stop listening to YouTube, children. Hey, son. Could you program the GBS for the Capitol building? Sure, Pa. You're driving for 16 days across America. Eventually you get to this town where they have the hugest Capitol B in Capitol. It's like, you've driven us to the Capitol B, son. <laughs> the Capitol B. But I put in Capitol. Oh, I put in Cap. I didn't. I was too tired to put the whole world building. <laughs> oh, man. Sorry, Dad. Sorry, Pa. <laughs> It's Google's fault, really. They gave me so many suggestions. <laughs> but curiously, son, you're the only member of our family whose name starts with the letter B. Right, Brian? Yeah, you're right. I must have some innate narcissistic tendencies that have no compunction about forcing my family to drive around aimlessly for 16 days to get as far from the Capitol building as possible because I'd rather go here in this quiet little sleepy hollow, Pa so we could have those conversations we used to have on TV in my mind when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe get a cup of coffee and you could stroke out while you're telling me where the treasure is buried. <laughs> but under your scalp would be a map, which I would cut off and follow <laughs> with Gina Davis, Gina da da Davis, into a cave where a bunch of psychopaths trap us and we need to jump with Matthew Modine into a pool where we await, we are awaited by even other predators that work for the British Navy. <laughs> How scandalous. Perhaps we should just do nothing, Pa, and just look up at the letter B and think, huh, it's kind of like the letter of the number two. <laughs> to be or not to be the number two, Pa? What do you think? Take it from there. <laughs> How did this go? start with a car commercial and end over here? I don't know. To be or not to be, that's the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to take on. Sorry. The slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. To suffer the slings, that's right. To be or not to be, whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows or to take arms to suffer, because you can kind of see and, right, to be and not to be, to suffer and to take arms against a sea of troubles, because the only way you're allowed to suffer in the English language is to become a soldier of fortune or a creature of the, the, the body of Christ, right, a good worker. So really, Hamlet is telling you how to be a good worker, you know? It's like Stalin must have been happy, like, oh, Hamlet, very good, to be or not to be. <laughs> For some reason, my evil people are always Oriental. I don't know. Imagine if Stalin was Oriental. And his famous speech was, To be or not to be, that is the question. 
but the tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of our righteous fortune, or to take up against a sea of trouble by opposing and them. And that's what made everything dead, because you made that choice, which was the only one you could make and the only way to suffer or do anything that's worth anything to the god of suffering himself. <laughs> I tell this to you because I am not stupid like white man. I refuse to repeat this drivel and not explain it to you, even though I have never seen it before, for I am Chinese and have never read Shakespeare. Where well, I have read Shakespeare, but if I was the China person, maybe that's what it is. But that's, you know, it's, it's your, you can only suffer by taking arms against the sea of suffering. You can only suffer by taking the sea of troubles, right? The sea of suffering, the sea of torture. It, so your fortunes become actually now taken from the, the new amionic or electronic system of breathing in a dead body. So in trying to give all your life to keeping the carcass of your dad's dead body alive against the reality of death itself. Even though nothing has ever really been completely dead in spirit, but that deprived of one's breath to nothing but this electronic universe of death um, death overcomes life, and life is but to give life to death, life against the reality of death, with every breath that you speak. If the spirit is sufficiently deprived, oxygen, air, so our bodies can work and yet cannot be fully developed. And I think a lot of us, a lot of human beings, live with different physical and mental pains from living in an excessively morbid electronic world of captivity. Captivity, the capital, capital building, the capital punishment. God's name in all capitals is always um, uh, a symbolic death, a symbolic language of death and a symbolic death. God is a symbol of death and a language of symbolic death, symbolic sacrifice. Right? Jesus can only make the most amazing symbolic sacrifice because it is so immersed in the in the symbols of death, the symbols of death. It, the symbols of death themselves come to life in the ocean of troubles. It is therefore immersed in an ocean of troubles that the nation begins to speak with naught but the symbols of death. The symbols of death become the currency of our lives, the tokens of the symbols of death, the um, units of exchange of our bodies for the body of death, our real life for our corporate existence, our value by birth to our value as a corporate instrument. Which is a play on words because we are, you know, the, the mortal coil is a corporate entity in life, but a dead entity in the incorporation of its life into the, the corporate nature of its instrumentation by birth as a lost soul. Uh. that however lost, its suffering of being anyone, suffering loss or dissociation isn't worth anything in itself, even though that's the basis of all currency, is something and everything being lost to all life in the universe. So you're breathing into the vacuum of space because a certain spirit of life has been eliminated from your own brain function. Like a different dimension, like a collective schizophrenia. And I describe that as a field or a torsion field where a certain kind of jurisdiction leads to people wielding 
reality itself over other people's personal reality. So when white people do violence, they are wielding a certain kind of reality over someone else's reality because they accept the personal reality of any beings at other times, even though no white person can really say that they're interested in eliminating anyone's sense of self, but rather they live so completely embroiled every day in proving their sense of self or improving it that they can barely recognize the self of any other being <laughs> because it's a language of suffering and a language of a certain kind of suffering that's even worth anything, right? Which is why, uh, like, parents can work really hard and suffer and wonder why their children aren't completely grateful for it. Children whose suffering, and beyond it, up to a certain point, doesn't mean anything to them. And the kind of legal suffering the parents are doing by working somehow doesn't mean enough to the children. <laughs> it's kind of interesting.